War is always brutal, but there might have been times in history where people have looked back at the weapons we've used in past wars and said, yeah, that was pretty messed up, even by war standards. That's how we got the United Nations Convention on Prohibitions or Restrictions on the use of certain conventional weapons which may be deemed to be excessively injurious or have indiscriminate effects, or Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons for short, or CCW for even shorter. The CCW serves to restrict the use of weapons seen as too brutal and too cruel for modern warfare, and anyone caught using these weapons is guilty of war crimes. But considering some of the horrifying weapons militaries have developed and used on one another throughout the thousands of years of human warfare, which weapons did the UN consider a bridge too far? Thankfully, it won't be that hard to find out, as all the banned weapons have been separated into five protocols. We'll break down some of these protocols and discuss some of the horrifying reasons each of these rules needed to be made in the first place. Protocol 1 applies to non-detectable fragments. It isn't against the law of war to use some fragmentation weapons. For example, the fragmentation or frag grenade has been a military staple for decades, and it's still common in use among soldiers today. Frag grenades have a very simple core principle. They're made of a metal casing designed to split into smaller pieces of shrapnel, with the explosive force from within the grenade superheating that shrapnel and firing it out in all directions at incredible speed. With some miraculous exceptions, the result of a frag grenade going off next to a human is pretty much always the same. If the explosion doesn't kill them, the massive bodily trauma of being shredded by the shrapnel will lead to a pretty quick death. In the cases of those lucky, or depending on the situation, unlucky enough to survive the blasts, x-rays can be used to detect the fragments so that field medics or surgeons can remove them if possible. In the eyes of the UN, this is all good sport, but Protocol 1 of the CCW forbids explosives or ammunition designed to harm its victims through fragments that are impossible to be detected with magnets or x-rays. Some bombs have historically used plastic or glass as their fragmentation element rather than metal. When superheated and fired into the body at great speeds, glass and plastic are just as painful and deadly as metal fragments, but are impossible to detect with an x-ray, and thus are impossible to operate out of a surviving victim. This sets a precedent for the kind of things the CCW forbids. Weapons of war should be designed to kill, not maim and mutilate. Weapons that seem excessively cruel, such as ones that leave survivors in an extended or permanent state of pain and suffering, should not be used. There's another qualifier that sends a weapon into war crime territory, but we'll get into that later. Another weapon banned from warfare by Protocol 1 of the CCW is frangible bullets. These special bullets are designed in some cases to prevent the danger of a ricochet occurring. These bullets are subject to brittle failure, where they disintegrate on impact, becoming countless tiny projectiles rather than one large one. But these bullets have a secondary effect beyond preventing a ricochet occurring, as outlined in the study, effects of a fragmenting handgun bullet, considerations for trauma care providers by Lynn Hockey, Allison Smith, Jonathan Babin, John Hunt, Juan Duchenne, and Patrick Griefenstein. The study states, expanding or fragmenting bullets are designed to inflict significantly more tissue damage than non-deformable bullets. This type of ammunition is prohibited in international warfare on the basis that it does not serve a military advantage but can result in excessive wounding and unnecessary suffering. There is no such ban for handgun ammunition for domestic use in most countries, including the United States. Ammunition manufacturers have recently released a fragmenting bullet that's designed to inflict a maximum amount of tissue damage. Two horrifying facts. The bullet being described here is the radically invasive projectile, also known by the sinister acronym RIP. War is brutal but perhaps not brutal enough to use ammo with a name that would fit right in the Grim Reaper's arsenal. With non-metal shrapnel explosives and terrifying frangible bullets out of the way, we move on to Protocol 2 of the CCW, mines, booby traps, and other devices. This protocol is a little more complicated than the first, with some parts regulating rather than outright banning certain weapons. Take for example landmines. These weapons are rightly infamous for the roles they played in the First and Second World Wars, as well as during the Vietnam War where they were responsible for countless cases of deaths and mutilations of unsuspecting soldiers. But soldiers dying in war is sadly part of the job description. It's the effects these weapons have on civilians caught in the crossfire that's led to the UN strictly regulating them. If countries lay landmines during a war, when the conflict ends, they're legally obligated to deactivate and collect these mines to reduce the probability of civilian casualties during peacetime. This falls under the second category we alluded to earlier, if the weapons don't discriminate and are equally likely to injure or kill civilians or combatants, their use will likely be considered criminal. 
Anti-personnel mines are also subject to extremely strict regulations, as these mines are specifically designed for use against human combatants rather than vehicles. The purpose must be to kill enemy combatants. Thus, anti-personnel mines that merely wound or disfigure enemy combatants are illegal under Protocol 2. But mines are one thing, booby traps are quite another. The details around this one are particularly horrifying, as the UN lists many specific regulations against the use of booby traps, implying there have been recorded instances of all of them. When you hear the phrase booby traps, you might envision pits full of razor-sharp punji sticks in the jungles of Vietnam, or maybe Indiana Jones running away from poison darts or a giant rolling boulder in some ancient underground tomb. Sadly, the reality is often a lot more gruesome. Here are a list of ways that the UN forbids booby traps being used in warfare. It's illegal to use booby traps attached to internationally recognized protective emblems, signs, or signals. For example, you can't hide a deadly trap in what looks like a Red Cross building. It's illegal to attach booby traps to sick, wounded, or dead people whom soldiers or humanitarian groups might seek to rescue or retrieve. It's illegal to booby trap burial, grave, and cremation sites, which is an advanced level of not having respect for the dead. It's illegal to booby trap medical facilities, medical equipment, medical supplies, or medical transportation. It's illegal to booby trap children's toys or other portable objects or products specially designed for the feeding, health, hygiene, clothing, or education of children. Let's just take a second to process that, because the idea that there were militaries out there booby trapping children's toys is about as close to objectively evil as it gets. Okay, moving on. It's illegal to booby trap food and drink as well as kitchen utensils or appliances, except in military establishments, military locations, or military supply depots. It's illegal to booby trap objects clearly of a religious nature, historic monuments, works of art, or places of worship which constitute the cultural or spiritual heritage of peoples, and of course, it's illegal to booby trap animals or their carcasses. It's good that these laws are in place, given that if militaries were already doing this, we definitely needed to rein them in. We wish we could tell you things would get less depressing and horrifying from here, but that would be a bald-faced lie. Unless you find people being burned to death whimsical and fun, in which case please don't take this video as a potential checklist of things you can do once you become a dictator. This is Protocol 3, Prohibitions or Restrictions on the Use of Incendiary Weapons. That is to say, any weapon that uses fire or heat as their main offensive capability. If you felt a prickle of heat on your skin, please don't expect that to go away anytime soon as we delve a little deeper into why this protocol is so important. Discovering fire is long viewed as a seminal moment in humanity's development, and we here at the Infographic Show speculate it was probably some 20 minutes or so after this discovery that someone was wondering if it could be used to kill people. From fire arrows to fiery projectiles thrown from siege weapons like catapults and trebuchets, to the terrifying Roman incendiary weapon known as Greek fire, which was used in rudimentary flamethrowers to burn down enemy ships. Fire has long been used as a tool of war, but these weapons seem positively quaint compared to the horrors of the M2 flamethrower and napalm used to burn down jungles and enemy combatants during the Vietnam War. Being burned to death is a horrible fate, far more so than being bombed or taking a bullet to the head, but that's if it kills you. You're equally likely to survive your run-in with an incendiary weapon and live the rest of your life horrifically burned, experiencing unimaginable pain and psychological stress. Another problem with incendiary weapons is that fire also tends to spread. Fire doesn't discriminate between the soldier and the civilian, between military installations and innocent homes or forests. It's the reason that the policy of completely annihilating everything that an enemy needs to wage war is known as scorched earth. Incidentally, enacting a scorched earth policy against civilians was also banned by the Geneva Convention in 1977. Strict restrictions are placed on the usage of incendiary weapons under Protocol 3. It's illegal to use incendiary weapons against civilian populations, areas, or objects including quote, any weapon or munition which is primarily designed to set fire to objects or to cause burn injury to persons through the action of flame, heat, or a combination thereof produced by a chemical reaction of a substance delivered on the target. Because of fire's nature to spread uncontrollably, it's also forbidden to air deliver incendiary weapons against military targets in the middle of highly concentrated civilian locations. Funnily enough, there are often strange and curious exceptions to some of these protocols. Take for example the UN's repeated attempts and chronic inability to meaningfully regulate thermobaric weapons or vacuum bombs. These are some of the most deadly explosives out there. They're bombs containing large amounts of incendiary fuel that's released and ignited upon detonation. 
creating a fiery explosion that sucks the oxygen out of the air to fuel its extremely violent chemical reaction. In other words, you get obliterated while also suffocating. What a treat! These terrifying weapons are not all regulated under the CCW. In what seems to be a perfect example of the regulatory blind spots in the UN's attempts to litigate warfare. This brings us to Protocol 4, Blinding Laser Weapons. Your reaction to that was probably, wait, the military has used blinding laser weapons? To which we say, this will not be the only existential nightmare you experience in this video. While this protocol doesn't prohibit the use of weapons against binoculars, periscopes, telescopes, and other optical equipment, nor can it penalize accidental blinding, the first article lays out, quote, it is prohibited to employ laser weapons specifically designed as their sole combat function or as one of their combat functions to cause permanent blindness to unenhanced vision, that is, to the naked eye or to the eye with corrective eyesight devices. This brings us back to the question of what kinds of weapons the UN wanted to regulate with Protocol 4. One of the most prominent and infamous ones was the Personnel Halting and Stimulation Response Rifle, or Phaser, because even the engineers tasked with creating cutting-edge weapons for the military are still huge Star Trek nerds. But while the name is fun, the weapon is decidedly less so. It's a laser rifle designed to, quote, temporarily blind the target. But if you crank the power up a bit too high, or if you put it in careless hands, temporary blindness can very quickly become permanent. I think we speak for everyone when we say that here at the Infographics Show, we're kind of relieved that the UN is keeping weapons like this out of warfare. But this next protocol helps to regulate an element of war that can stick around for long after the war itself has ended. Protocol 5. Explosive Remnants of War We already spoke out about the danger of unexploded landmines, but this protocol hopes to both reinforce that and reduce the harm caused by unexploded cluster bombs. If you aren't familiar with the concept of the cluster bomb, it's a rather infamous weapon that's been used in countless wars since its invention during World War II. The general principle is that a cluster bomb is full of smaller bombs known as submunitions. These fall indiscriminately over the target area, exploding and carpeting a vast swath of land with deadly fire. They're extremely inhumane weapons, capable of just as easily massacring civilians as troops, but even worse, not all the submunitions explode at once. Some remain undetonated, embedded in the land, and at the constant risk of exploding or injuring civilians. It's really no question as to why the UN would have problems with them and seek to remedy their effects with litigation. Of course, the CCW isn't the only set of international laws forbidding the use of certain weapons in warfare. Before we think about the dark potential futures of warfare, let's take a quick look at a disturbing grab bag of other banned weapons. First, poisoned bullets. First invented and pioneered by the one and only Leonardo da Vinci as ballistic shells filled with sulfur and arsenic, these were some of the first weapons ever barred by an agreement between nations, the Strasbourg Agreement of 1675 between Rome and France. Not that this stopped any other nations from trying later, as the US military experimented with lacing bullets with the deadly toxin ricin during World War I. This idea thankfully never caught on. Later, the Geneva Convention forbade the use of chemical weapons and poisoned gas under the CWC, or Chemical Weapons Convention. Three particular chemical weapons that have been restricted are the nerve agent Novichok, the previously mentioned poison ricin, and the infamous sarin gas which Syria was sanctioned for using on its own people during the Syrian civil war, despite signing the CWC in 2013. But what about biological weapons? Bioweapons aren't just exclusive to Resident Evil villains, they've been a mainstay of hundreds of different armies across millennia. Genghis Khan and the Mongols used corpses to spread disease among their enemies. Centuries later, armies in Europe during the Middle Ages catapulted the corpses of dead animals into the fortresses they were sieging, getting the people trapped inside dangerously sick. Centuries later, Europeans colonizing North America used blankets infected with smallpox to murder scores of Native Americans. Even as recently as Vietnam, the Viet Cong coated their punji sticks with human feces, making the injuries they caused extra infectious. Naturally, with our increasing understanding of the destructive potential for viral and germ warfare, it's understandable that the 1972 Biological Weapons Convention was created to prevent movies like Contagion and 28 days later from becoming documentaries. And of course, there are dirty bombs, a weapon whose mere mention can cause heart rates to spike. Dirty bombs fuse the worst parts of a conventional and nuclear explosive. It's a conventional bomb laced with nuclear material, essentially making it a distribution system for radiation that will sicken and kill indiscriminately over a wide area, potentially irradiating said area for decades 
centuries or even millennia to come. It's also incidentally a lot easier to make than a standard nuclear weapon, which is why the world's nations are often a lot more worried about terrorists making them than whole countries with access to full-on nuclear warheads and the means to launch them. We've looked at the horrors of wars past that the international community has tried to prevent from repeating themselves, but weapons developments move a lot faster than international conflict legislation. That's why many have suggested a potential future Protocol 6 lethal autonomous weapons, aka Skynet-style killer robots. Yep, that's right, the UN is fully expecting weapons companies to start investing in and manufacturing autonomous weapon systems, and they're just hoping to get ahead of the curve. Hopefully it won't take a few autonomous weapons atrocities to get those laws passed. It's time to crack open the Forbidden Armory. These weapons are too deadly and brutal even for war, affecting anyone from combatants to civilians alike. These are the most insane weapons banned from modern warfare. Number 15. Incendiary Weapons Fire. There is no more powerful force in nature. A single spark out of place can cause a massive blaze that can wipe out hundreds of years of human progress. The visuals on the news are stark. Homes burned, people suffering from terrible burns, and a wave of air pollution that can poison the air for miles around and be seen a state away. When wildfires occur, it often takes hundreds of people to put them out, and the losses are massive, which makes it no surprise that some people would try to harness that power to defeat their enemies. This tactic has a long history. Incendiary weapons use ignition rather than detonation to start the attack, ensuring that they burn slower and longer. Thermal weapons have been used since the ancient times, using substances like oil, animal fat, and resin to spark the flame. Then came gunpowder, allowing bigger and more powerful incendiary devices to be built, and eventually dropped on enemy territory from planes. They advanced fast, with World War II being largely defined by the use of powerful weapons like napalm that set cities afire, and this would continue in many wars to come, particularly Vietnam. So, how did these weapons wind up banned? The Vietnam War shocked people with its stark visuals of the brutality of war, and napalm attacks were responsible for many of the worst visuals. Additionally, incendiary weapons can be hard to control, and the blazes can last long enough to endanger soldiers on both sides. That led to the 1980 Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons to ban their use, within limits. They can still be used in a targeted fashion to target enemies but not against larger areas, and the use of tools like flamethrowers can be used to clear brush, but not as a weapon. One of the most likely types of weapons to be banned? Those that are only here to cause extra suffering. Number 14. Cluster Munitions Nothing is more common in a war zone than the sight of falling bombs. Civilians know this and know how to survive these bombardments. They seek cover when the planes fly overhead, survive the initial shock, and head out to explore once the initial danger is passed. Or has it? Because the enemy didn't just drop a standard bomb, it dropped one that scattered hundreds of other small bombs, meaning that every step someone takes in the bombed area could result in an explosion that will kill or maim someone who survived the first wave. And now the danger could last indefinitely. This is the horror of a cluster bomb. So, why would anyone create these horrible devices? For one thing, they're effective at creating terror and driving people underground to decrease resistance, but they're also used effectively in war. Scattering mini bombs around the battlefield could destroy enemy vehicles when they roll into the battlefield, and they're also good at destroying infrastructure. If the first hit doesn't knock out the enemy's power or make their runways impossible to use, maybe all those little follow-up hits will, and they've had a long successful run maybe too successful and too brutal. These weapons have been used since the Vietnam War and have shown up in almost every battle since. They've left a trail of maimed civilians and no-go zones in their wake, and while some countries continue to use them, with the bombs showing up in recent conflicts in Syria, Yemen, and Ethiopia, over 120 countries have said no more. The Convention on Cluster Munitions was first adopted in 2008, and since then a majority of the world's countries have signed on and ensured that civilians won't have to needlessly suffer. One of the banned weapons left a legacy of carnage decades long. Number 13. Landmines Some of the deadliest weapons around turn the very terrain against the enemy. A unit's walking through a jungle, they hear a faint click, and as soon as someone moves, they're blown sky high. Not only are they maimed or killed by an explosion from the ground, but it's likely that anyone around them is hit by the shrapnel as well. Any enemy soldiers in the territory also immediately hear the explosion and can descend on the injured unit and finish them before they have a chance to recover. It's not surprising that this weapon became 
became very popular. Early landmines were first used as far back as the 9th century armed with gunpowder, but it wasn't until the First World War that their use truly exploded in more ways than one. The use of more powerful explosives and more sensitive technology meant European battlefields were heavily lined with them, and those that didn't go off stayed there after the war, rendering many places dangerous even years after war. But it didn't stop them from being used in every major conflict since, with millions of landmines being planted in countries around the world. And it wasn't the deaths in wars that got the people's attention. Cambodia Sudan and Iraq were just three of the countries where landmines were used extensively. And the civilians in those countries soon found that just because the war was over, it didn't mean the threat was. Countless people lost lives and limbs due to unexploded landmines, and the world responded. In 1997, a convention was formed to ban their use in conflict, and most of the world's nations have signed on, but not including the three most powerful nations in the world, Russia, China, and the United States. And while their use might be outlawed, getting rid of the millions already planted will take a long time and weapons don't always need to be fatal to get banned. Number 12. Blinding Lasers One of the newest weapons in the military's arsenal, lasers are unique in that they don't expire and they don't explode. They're generated by the weapon firing them, and the only limit is how much energy the machine has available. Research is being done into many uses for lasers, from cutting through metal or shooting weapons out of the sky, but one use in particular is controversial, using them to target the vision of enemy soldiers, blinding them. And this is a common enough topic that's become a discussion in international law. So, what are the rules relating to lasers? For one thing, armies can still use them. Blinding weapons are still allowed, as long as they're meant to only cause temporary damage and neutralize the army while still allowing them to regain their vision. Lasers can also be used in other ways, even if they have the potential to cause blindness. So, if it's not the intended purpose to target eyes, the army has deniability. The effect is similar to someone staring directly at the sun, except the sun is concentrated in a single beam and is shooting directly at you. This raises the question, are blinding lasers actually out there? Unlike other banned weapons like landmines, which are everywhere and have been for a long time, blinding lasers are rare. Some are used in Iraq, and many reports indicate China is developing laser weapons. Israel is also looking to replace its current Iron Dome missile system with a laser system that can intercept rockets. It looks increasingly like lasers might be the future, and that led the Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons to ban their use for deliberate blinding in 1995. This next ban dated back longer than any other. Number 11. Poisoned Bullets the Geneva Convention? Forget about it. Let's dial it back to the Strasbourg Agreement of 1675 between France and the Holy Roman Empire, one of the very first treaties ever regarding the use of weapons, and the man behind the weapons that led to it? None other than Leonardo da Vinci, who had created some of the first ever enhanced weapons such as shells filled with arsenic and sulfur that could be used to target the crews of ships. But it wasn't the first time bullets had been poisoned. That goes back to the creation of guns and bullets, when armies would use animal dung or dead bodies to contaminate bullets, leading to fatal infections. It wouldn't be the last time this idea was used. The deal between France and the Holy Roman Empire de-escalated the war, but the appeal of poisoned bullets spread far and wide. After all, wouldn't it be great to know you got in a fatal shot even if you only winged them? While poisoning each individual bullet was a time-consuming task, and this was one of the only reasons this form of warfare didn't catch on more, it was an ongoing threat through the next few hundred years, and it wouldn't be the last time that banning them was discussed. But it's a long road to actually removing a deadly weapon from the world. In 1875, another conference advised the banning of early chemical weapons, and 25 years later, the Hague Declaration banned the use of projectiles that would distribute poison gas. But the use of poisoned bullets largely slipped under the radar, and nothing would be firmly established until after the First World War. Today, the use of poisoned bullets is outlawed by most nations, and it's rarely a threat. But that may be because it's far more effective to target the enemy with modern weaponry, and there's no shortage of new and deadly weapons. But it's not the only bullet type to be sent out to pasture. Number 10. Expanding Ordnance it sounds like a funny name, Dum Dum Bullets. But these aren't some gag ammo that a clown shoots out of a neon-colored gun. They're one of the deadliest and most brutal weapons ever invented. When someone gets shot in the battlefield, their odds are slim. Conditions aren't great, the unit's under fire, and the choice is either to get them back to a field hospital before they bleed out, or try a risky battlefield surgery with a high risk of infection. But those odds go from slim to none when the bullet is designed to make a life-saving surgery more difficult. Because these bullets aren't designed to just pass straight through the body. When the hollow point or soft point bullet enters the body. They expand on impact and grow inside the body. This slows their impact and causes more damage as they move through, often stopping inside the body. While standard bullets might go in and out and leave the target alive, expanding bullets are more likely to cause a fatal injury. They're popular for use in hunting, because nothing ruins a good shot more quickly than an angry deer with a bullet wound charging right at you. But if you're trying to save a gunshot victim, it's a very different story. Because the bullet expands behind the wound, it's common for it to be 
as much as twice the size of the entry wound, which makes it tricky to remove it in a safe way. The bullets are still legal for use by hunters and police departments, although that use is controversial, but they've been illegal according to the Hague Convention since 1899. Surprisingly, there is no mention of these weapons in the Geneva Conventions, but most countries abide by this long-standing international taboo, with the Nazis being one of the few to violate it in 1941. Other weapons leave behind even trickier remnants. Number 9. Non-Detectable Fragments There's been a terrible explosion and several soldiers are bleeding. They're rushed to a field hospital and the surgeon gets to work removing the shrapnel, but something is wrong. The soldier is still bleeding out, and x-rays aren't showing any remaining shrapnel. The surgeon has two choices, start digging around in the body manually, causing additional injuries and prolonging the soldier's recovery, or simply let nature take its course. But what dark secret is lurking in the wounded soldier's body? It's one of the darkest secrets of warfare. Bombs and landmines are often equipped with a dirty little secret, a payload of fragments not made of metal but of other material like plastic or glass. While large pieces might show up on x-rays, it's easy for tiny fragments of this material to hide in the body and continue causing damage even after surgery is done. In minor cases, this could cause chronic pain pain become a major problem later if they shift. In major cases, they could cause uncontrolled bleeding and that makes it impossible to save the patient. And the world decided it was time to act. The convention on certain conventional weapons banned a lot of weapons that had no function other than to cause additional pain and death. The weapons equipped with these hidden dangers were among them. It's considered to be a war crime to use them, and they can primarily be found in tactics used by guerrilla armies, similar to poisoned bullets. But the ban on non-detectable fragments expanded to something else, landmines. While not every country banned the hidden weapons, the ban on plastic landmines that can't be found by x-rays is more widespread. Surprisingly, some weapons are banned in war but legal elsewhere. Number 8. Tear Gas and Pepper Spray It doesn't seem like the same level as the other weapons on this list. After all, tear gas is frequently used by police in domestic conflicts to disperse groups of protesters or make it easier to arrest them. It's painful but rarely fatal. And the similar pepper spray can even be used in some places as a personal weapon. But it's classified as an inhalant chemical weapon and that means it's covered under the Hague Convention, making it technically illegal to use in combat. Why are non-lethal weapons like this banned in war? It's not just because it's a chemical weapon, it's because it violates the laws of war by incapacitating soldiers in the middle of a lethal engagement. While in civilian use, tear gas is assumed to be a non-lethal crowd control weapon used as a substitute for lethal force, there's no such thing as a non-lethal engagement in warfare. Soldiers are prepared to shoot and kill their enemy, and it wouldn't be very sporting to gun them down while they can't even see or breathe properly because of a wave of tear gas. But just because it's illegal doesn't mean it wasn't used. In World War I, tear gas gas was actually the most commonly used chemical weapon and the Hague Convention was largely ignored. It continues to be used commonly in combat situations and international law agencies usually have higher priorities. But it's common enough that when soldiers go through military training, they're usually deliberately exposed to tear gas to show them how their protective gear works and to build their endurance. Because would there be anything scarier than a soldier walking through tear gas seemingly unbothered? But it's far from the most lethal gas used in combat. Number 7. Poison Gas Might sound like something you'd spray on your hot dog to give it a little added kick. But mustard gas has nothing to do with the condiment. It's actually one of the most notorious chemical weapons of all time and gets its name from the yellow-brown color it takes on when it's released and its scent that vaguely resembles mustard plants. But don't take a nice long whiff. Based on sulfur, it can have devastating consequences for those who inhale it, starting with painful blisters on the skin that can make it impossible to move. But that's nothing compares to what happens if you inhale it. It causes devastating chemical burns which can affect the lungs and make it painful or impossible to breathe. It can also cause damage to the eyes, and studies have shown the gas is heavily carcinogenic. That means it can have a devastating effect even after the initial effects have passed. But no one really knew that since it was used in mass in the First World War. Poison gases had been in development since 1822. But when the Germans used them in combat, it kicked off an arms race, and soon the battlefields were lousy with poison gas. It was bad enough that it horrified the world. The aftermath of the war made people question whether gas should be used in combat, especially since it lingered in the air and could poison the ground. The deadlier gases that followed, including phosgene gas, which caused lethal fluid buildup in the lungs, and nerve gas, a neurotoxin that affected organ function and caused long-term physical issues in the few survivors, only made the case stronger. The world soon acted and these poison gases were banned in the 1920s. 25 Geneva Protocol. Surprisingly, it stuck, with even the Axis powers largely refraining from the use of the deadly weapons in World War II. However, they haven't gone away completely. Nerve gas was used in deadly terror attacks around the world, and the lethal gases continue to show up in conflicts like the Syrian Civil War. Now let's take a look at some of the oddest weapons ever banned from war. Number 6. Animals This doesn't mean that animals can't be used in war at all, although PETA might disagree. For thousands of years, armies used horses and other steeds to carry warriors and equipment to battle. Man's best friend 
brand can help sniff out danger as well, but other uses of animals as weapons of war are far more unethical. Rats and insects could be used to spread disease, and it would be considered a form of biological warfare, but some armies try much more creative methods of using animals as weapons of war. The US investigated using bats and birds to deliver weapons during World War II, while the Soviets used dogs as kamikaze bombers to take out tanks. Whether these strange uses of animals would be illegal is up for debate. Any attempt to use animals to spread pathogens or distribute incendiary weapons could fall under the ban on these weapons in combat. After all, animals can't aim a weapon to avoid civilian casualties. Recycling isn't always a good idea. Number 5. Unexploded bombs. Landmines, cluster mines, and other remnants of war. They're not just dangerous to those wandering around, they could be a low-cost alternative to fight back in asymmetrical wars. This became especially clear in the long-term insurgent war in Afghanistan. The Soviet Union deployed a lot of bombs in the infamous Graveyard of Empires, and not all of them exploded. The next generation of radicals in the country, the Taliban, would later collect these bombs and use them to line the roads, causing an explosion when a truck drove over them. These low-cost IEDs were no less deadly than modern bombs, even if they were decades old, so the world banned them in Protocol 5 of the Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons. But this one doesn't fall entirely on the people using the old bombs. The convention requires the parties involved in hostility to clear any explosive remnants of war once the hostilities are over. Number 4. Spike Pits it seems like something out of Looney Tunes, a pit full of spikes, carefully covered to make it look like just a part of the terrain. But as soon as an enemy soldier steps on the ground, it gives way and they plummet down to a painful death below. The traps were usually laden with sharpened sticks or bamboo, making them a low-cost, low-tech but high-energy way to fill the battlefield with booby traps. In many ways, they were the first landmines, and they were a problem for armies going back millennia. But they were used as recently as World War II in the Pacific Theater and the Vietnam War, before being eventually outlawed by the 1979 convention on certain conventional weapons. Making them even more controversial, many armies would take up the danger factor on these traps by contaminating the traps with animal droppings, making them likely to give a victim a fatal infection. While they've long fallen out of favor with modern armies, it's impossible to know which battlefield they'll show up on next. Death comes from below, but it can also come from above. Number 3. Balloon Bombs while they fall under the general ban on incendiary weapons, the balloon bomb is its own twisted creation, creating free-floating balloons of death that explode when punctured and unleash unpredictable deadly fire on an enemy battlefield. They were proposed as far back as 1792 and were unleashed on Italy by Austrian forces in 1849. But in World War II, the skies were full of fire. The British launched nearly 100,000 balloons at Germany, over half of them carrying incendiary payloads, and the only successful attack to hit the US mainland was the Japanese Fugo balloon attack, one of which killed six civilians in Oregon. While the balloons didn't have a high success rate, they created a climate of terror, and because they were free-floating and impossible to control, there was no way to know where the fire they ignited would burn. It was a relief for all when they were banned in 1979, but they haven't gone away completely, showing up in recent conflicts between Israeli and Palestinian forces at the Gaza Strip. But some weapons can leave a much longer legacy. Number 2. Nuclear Weapons Wait, what? But the nuclear arms race is ongoing and the US and Russia have a stockpile of thousands. But despite these massive weapons defining the 20th century and beyond, they are technically illegal. In 1968, a treaty banning the further proliferation of nuclear weapons was ratified and countries that violate it could face sanctions. But it's controversial for one big reason. It recognizes the states who currently have nuclear weapons and doesn't require them to give them up. The only states who have refused to sign it are India and Pakistan, which developed nuclear weapons, Israel, who is believed to have a secret nuclear program, and North Korea, who withdrew from the treaty to begin developing its own. Given the earth-shattering danger of these weapons, now much more powerful than the ones deployed at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, it's not surprising many people want them banned altogether. In 2021, a UN treaty banning their future production went into effect without the signatures of any of the world's nuclear powers. But this is one type of weapon scientists and watchdogs fear even more. Number 1. Biological Weapons A virus unleashed on the world can kill millions or even endanger humanity's survival. The Black Death alone killed up to a third of Europe in the Middle Ages. Biological warfare is similar to the Pandora's box because when a novel disease is unleashed that no one knows how to treat or cure, it can be unstoppable. But that hasn't stopped people from trying to weaponize these deadly plagues and unleash them on their enemy, no matter the consequences. And this form of war goes back centuries, starting with contaminating weapons with diseases from the deceased. But when combined with modern technology, the threat only increased. Some of the deadliest diseases around the world were processed into weaponized forms, including anthrax, cholera, dysentery, typhus, and even the notorious plague. Experiments were also done on fast-acting rice fungus that could devastate food crops and on engineering mosquitoes and fleas to spread disease. If unleashed effectively, these weapons could deliver a blow to the population that would far outstrip any conventional weapon. But there was one thing holding armies in check. 
diseases don't stop where you want them to. Not only can you not control how diseases spread, but the more they spread, the more they mutate. That meant that the very same virus one army unleashed could eventually cross their borders in a much deadlier form. That fear was enough for the world to ratify a treaty banning the development, production, or stockpiling of biological weapons in 1972. All but 14 countries have signed the treaty, largely consigning these weapons to the dustbin of history. But many countries still have these deadly weaponized diseases sitting in cold storage. As you may have seen in some of our other shows, while it may seem a contradiction to some some people, in conflicts all sides should follow a set of rules concerning the ethics of warfare. You have likely heard of the Geneva Conventions, which are a set of treaties and protocols that ask countries if they should fight against each other, they should at least try to do that following humanitarian principles. For example, countries should care for the wounded, they should not abuse POWs, they should respect a soldier's religion, and they should not use weapons deemed unfair play on the battleground. And it's the latter which we'll discuss today in this episode of the Infographics Show. Banned Weapons in Warfare – Blinding Laser Weapons We'll start with weapons that sound kind of modern, and these are the tools that could be used to destroy the eyesight of enemies. These types of weapons were banned under Protocol 4 of the 1980 Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons, and the protocols covered weapons that could permanently blind someone, not just temporarily dazzle a person. Do such weapons exist? Motherboard wrote in 2014 that, indeed, the USA has many lasers that could permanently blind a person, but the country does not use them for that purpose. But sometimes there was a fine line between dazzling and doing much worse. The US media has said China has some very similar technology, calling some weapons blinding lasers. And while no soldiers have been blinded as of yet, the US military has asked if these weapons don't breach the protocols. Landmines Possibly a soldier's worst nightmare are landmines, explosives which have been used in various war movies to show us just how barbaric war can be. Under the Protocol on Prohibitions or Restrictions of the Use of Mines, Booby Traps, and Other Devices, landmines are now at least restricted. Non-detectable anti-personnel mines are not allowed, as are mines that are placed outside fenced areas. According to the UN, a lot of damage is still being done, as there are still so many mines laying around the world. According to an article written by UNICEF, there are around 110 million mines globally that are just waiting for someone to walk over them. There's no date on this article, but it's said hundreds of people around the world are still being killed by landmines every year. As for booby traps, you can find lots of articles written about how they were used during the Vietnam War. Thankfully, in conventional warfare, these things are now also banned. Flamethrowers Another weapon you may have seen in numerous war movies is the flamethrower. These are called incendiary weapons, and they're now banned for certain uses under the Protocol on Prohibitions or Restrictions on the Use of Incendiary Weapons. They're not completely banned, it just depends on what you intend to do with them. You cannot, for example, use them to destroy houses and the people inside the houses. You're not even supposed to use them to burn down forests or even bushes. You can, however, use them for clearing woodland if the land is thought to be hiding combatants or other things related to combat. Historians tell us that all sides during the two world wars were big on using these devices, mostly to do things like empty trenches and holes where soldiers might be hiding. The website The Balance tells us, during the Korean and Vietnam Wars, United States Marines also used flamethrowers. In those combat environments, flamethrowers were used to destroy forts, bunkers, and vehicles. They were also used to inflict psychological terror on enemy soldiers who were terrified of being burned alive. Not surprisingly, these weapons were very controversial, and in 1978 the US said, enough is enough, we're not using them again. The same goes for napalm. While it's not completely banned, it can't really be used in warfare to kill people. Cluster Bombs Many countries around the world have signed the Convention on Cluster Munitions Treaty. These are bombs designed to be dropped and then expel a number of smaller bombs, sometimes called bomblets. For this reason, sometimes in the US they got the nickname popcorn bombs or firecrackers. As you can imagine, these things can be a bit unpredictable, and so it's not always easy to judge what will be destroyed. This is the reason many countries have now agreed that they should be used no more. This only happened fairly recently though, and you can find examples of when these kind of bombs were used by the UK, the US, and many other countries not that long ago. One of the main reasons for trying to stop the use of these things is that those bomblets might remain unexploded, and then one day a very unfortunate civilian comes across one of them. Nerf Gas If any of you have seen the TV show Homeland, you'll know that possibly one of the most frightening things in the world 
is what's known as nerve gas. In that show, the use of sarin, a kind of nerve gas, was explored. While Homeland could be said to be quite implausible at times, how it depicted sarin was by no means over the top. What basically happens when you're hit by the nerve gas is your body malfunctions, your nervous system stops working, internal hemorrhaging happens, and death is likely to follow. Before that, you might start foaming at the mouth, suffer convulsions, and then pee and poo yourself. Your organs will then stop working, and that's the end. Mustard gas. This is another nasty chemical agent that does very nasty things to people. You can see what it did by reading about the two world wars. Those that experienced mustard gas poisoning might experience temporary blindness, they might suffer horrible burns on their skin, and their lungs can be severely damaged. If they don't die, soldiers often had to endure horrific pain from severe burns. Nowadays, it's unlikely you'll see the use of this gas, as most countries have ratified the Chemical Weapons Convention. Mustard gas is known as a blister agent, but other gases, such as phosgene gas and hydrogen cyanide, are also banned. Tear gas You might be surprised to hear that tear gas is banned in war, just because it's still quite regularly used on citizens. It's still a chemical weapon, but it's one of the least harmful weapons of its kind. For that reason, it can still be used to disperse crowds of rioters, but using it on the battleground would be sending a bad message. In a riot, it's believed that this gas can prevent a more deadly or at least aggressive use of force. That's why it's still being used today. Spike Pit It sounds like something John Rambo might come up with, but these pits were used in some conflicts until they were outlawed under the Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons, also known as punji sticks. They were basically a hole in the ground with some very sharp sticks. The hole was then covered with something so that anyone walking in its direction wouldn't notice anything. When it was stepped on, the soldier would fall into the pit and land on the spikes. This would cause severe pain and it would be incredibly difficult to get out of this trap. It's also said that sometimes the spikes would be covered with poison or even human feces so that infection would occur. The point would not be to kill someone, but to maim them and so slow down everyone else. Biological Weapons you may have seen in some of our other shows that militaries all over the world have spent a considerable amount of time trying to invest ways to spread disease among enemies. Sometimes called germ warfare, we might look back to the 18th century when the English military were busy trying to spread smallpox through some Native American societies. We are told that with a green light given by Winston Churchill, tularemia, anthrax, brucellosis, and botulism were made into weapons during World War II. It wasn't only the British though, France, Germany, the USA, and Japan were all busy weaponizing disease. You name it, all the leading nations of the world were doing the same thing, at times weaponizing even the bubonic plague. Thanks to the Biological and Toxin Weapons Convention, we hope that those days might be over, although that won't have any effect on the work that terrorists do. We might also add that in the past such weapons weren't only designed to hurt people directly, but they were there to spoil crops and make livestock sick. Dirty Bombs These things were designed to radiate an area and so make that place uninhabitable. These did not have a blast but, as we said, just created a lot of radiation over a given area. We're told that they likely wouldn't even have caused that much damage, but they instilled fear in communities and so were useful. Bat Bombs We've designated an entire show to these utterly strange things, so you should take a look at that. What these were is what they sound like, which were bats carrying small bombs. They were designed by the USA to fly over Japan, and there, lots of bats would be released and each bat would find a safe place to hide down in the city. Many buildings at the time were made from wood, and when the bat bomb went off, a fire would start. Such things these days would be banned under Protocol 3 of the Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons. You can't exactly control where the bat will go, and you're not allowed to use weapons when you have no idea what the target will be. This could cause untold harm to civilians. Invisible Fragments An entire protocol in the Convention on Certain Conventional Weapons is Protocol 1, which restricts weapons with non-detectable fragments. This is simple enough. You can't employ any kind of weapon which might leave bits of itself in another person that cannot be seen even with x-ray. That means that you're not allowed to make a weapon that leaves plastic in the body, as this can be hard to find. You can use plastic in a weapon's production, but plastic shouldn't be part of the design primarily to hit the person or persons. 
We should add at the end here that many countries have agreed not to use these weapons, but others have not signed the treaties. Some countries have also signed, but done that with what are called reservations. Bullets ricochet off the wall, explosions fill the streets, a soldier is pinned down by the enemy. This could be the end for him. Luckily, he has his Kumlauf attachment allowing him to fire around any corner, but the weapon jams. Next, he pulls out his heat ray to fry the enemy, but with a little sunscreen, it's rendered ineffective. It's time to get the hell out of Dodge. The soldier hops in his rota buggy, hits the accelerator, and switches on the propeller system to fly off into the sunset. But like all those other weird weapons in his arsenal, this one fails as well. It's fair to say he's having a bad day. These weapons sound like something out of a bad spy movie, but each one was constructed and tested for combat. However, due to design flaws, none of them are still in use. Let's find out which weird weapon was the worst of the worst. Since humans could walk, there's been conflict. In the early days of war, elephants were the tanks of the army. These massive creatures posed a huge problem for generals that needed to be overcome, so in the 2nd century BC, the Romans came up with what they thought was an ingenious plan to stop enemy elephants in their tracks. In order to do this, they did something really awful to a bunch of pigs. The Romans knew that the elephants didn't like hawks. For whatever reason, the fast-moving, squealing animals frightened the large elephants, causing them to rear up and throw their handlers off their backs. But the Romans wanted to take things up a notch. They would cover their pigs in tar and light them on fire. The pigs would then become a primitive form of an anti-tank missile. However, these biological flaming missiles ended up being a terrible idea. The pig couldn't be aimed, and it didn't last very long before it died. This meant that when the pigs were released, they ended up running away from the battle and dying in a smoldering heap without so much as passing by the enemy. There were even cases where the flaming pigs backfired by running through the ranks of the Roman soldiers and setting them on fire instead of the enemy. All in all, the flaming pig missiles were an epic fail. The next weapon didn't go up in smoke like the pigs, but froze to death instead. Project Habakkuk seemed like such a terrible idea, it's amazing how far it actually got. The Habakkuk was conceived of by a British engineer named Geoffrey Pike during World War II. His idea was to build an entire aircraft carrier out of pikecrete, a mixture of ice and wood pulp. That's right, Mr. Pike wanted to construct a naval ship out of ice. It isn't hard to guess what problems led to the failure of that vessel. The Habakkuk was supposed to be a way to launch aircraft from the middle of the Atlantic Ocean to combat German U-boats. One of the reasons aircraft carriers were rare during the war was because they required a massive amount of resources. Steel and other metals were necessary to build tanks, guns, and aircraft, so using them to build the giant ships was not always cost-effective. Pike proposed making whole ships out of ice to combat the supply chain problem. The Pikecrete mixture was around 86% water and 14% wood pulp, both of which were plentiful at the time. However, constructing an entire aircraft carrier out of mostly ice had its problems. A 1,000-ton model was constructed in Canada to show that the ice ship was a viable option, but they ran into some issues. The most prominent was that the entire hull began to melt. The pike crete needed to be kept around 0 degrees Fahrenheit, which was much more easily said than done. The air temperature rarely was that low, and the water temperature was never that cold. This meant the engineers needed to develop a way to install air conditioning systems across the ship. Clearly, this wouldn't be cost-effective and also led to hundreds of other problems. It became clear that an aircraft carrier made out of ice would not be the future of the Royal Navy. The entire project was deemed a failure, and the British continued to build steel ships the old-fashioned way. But the Habakkuk was not the only embarrassing failed ship in military history. History. Russia also created a strange-looking vessel that was a complete disaster. The Novgorod was a circular ship that looked like a giant floating dinner plate. The Russians thought it was a brilliant design, but they would soon come to find it was a big round mistake. The hull was just over 100 feet in diameter and was mounted with large guns that could be used to defend the ship or fire onto land. A few years after its completion, the Novgorod was put to test during the Russo-Turkish War of 1877 and 1878. The Novgorod was sent down the Danube River to aid in battle. However, when it unleashed its cannons, something embarrassing happened. The turrets on the vessel were placed on turntables so they could be adjusted to aim at different targets. However, due to loose locks, when the cannon fired, they spun around on their turntables and the crew would need to wait for them to stop spinning before reorienting them and firing again. This would later be fixed by reinforcing the locking mechanism, but it was enough to create a persistent myth about how the entire ship would rotate whenever fired. Its circular shape also made the Novgorod bulky and extremely hard to maneuver. This meant it needed to move slowly, and by the time it was positioned correctly, the battle would already be over. The Russians got so fed up with the failings of the Novgorod that they decided to tie it up at the dock and just leave it. This 
circular ship seemed to be more amusing to watch than helpful during a fight. After the war, the Novgorod was retired. One of the biggest fears for a soldier is being out in the open during combat. This next failed military device literally put the soldier in the worst position of all. The VZ-1 Pawnee was a flying platform that would carry a soldier up into the sky using a helicopter-like propeller system. The idea seems pretty cool, as the soldier would be able to hover in mid-air. But when you think about it, all the flying platform did was make that soldier an easy target. The device was developed in the 1950s by Hiller Helicopters. It had two rotors contained within the platform that allowed it to fly and hover where a soldier stood on top of the contraption. There were no wings, and the rotor was fixed, meaning the only way for the soldier to move the VZ-1 Pawnee was by shifting his body weight from side to side. This could put him in a precarious position as he tried to return fire at the enemy while controlling the platform. It also didn't help that it would only take one or two direct hits from enemy bullets to damage the device and send the soldier plummeting to his death. The VZ-1 Pawnee was cool to look at and must have been fun in testing, but it just didn't make any sense in combat. This led to the whole thing being scrapped before anyone was sent flying into battle on them. The VZ-1 was not the only failed flying contraption of the time, however. In fact, during World War II, the British tried to make a flying car, but the whole thing ended in disaster. There were no bad ideas when it came to machines that could defeat the Nazis. However, the designers of the Hafner Rota Buggy might have taken the sentiment a little too far. The Hafner Rota Buggy was supposed to be a flying jeep, which allowed soldiers to cross over rivers, minefields, and enemy positions with the flick of a switch. The jeep was equipped with a rotor and tail fins, giving it some maneuverability, but not not much. The whole thing weighed a ton, meaning the fuel tank would drain almost instantly, resulting in the craft crashing to the ground. Also, a Jeep is not the most aerodynamic vehicle, which made controlling it in flight rather tricky. The whole project was eventually scrapped, and the British decided to use a plane towed glider to deliver land vehicles instead. Ready for a dad joke about weird failed weapons? The active denial system was such a horrible idea that the military is in denial that they ever tried it. The active denial system was basically a heat gun used to give enemy soldiers and unruly crowds intense burns. The weapon was built to look similar to a satellite dish and would focus radiation towards someone as a deterrent. This would make them incredibly uncomfortable and could cause entire crowds to disperse. The thought was that the high frequency waves hitting the person would make them feel like they're in a microwave causing burns, nausea, and extreme discomfort. The active denial system was built in 2010 and had a price tag of around $40 million. It lasted about a month in the field and was quickly recalled. The reason why made the R&D team shake their heads in shame. Instead of causing massive discomfort to whoever it was aimed at, the heat gun just gave them a slight sunburn. This might have been beneficial for breaking up crowds of people, but the heat gun would have had very little effect if you shot it at an enemy in battle. In fact, anyone wearing sunscreen would have barely noticed the heat gun at all, as it would have protected them from the high-frequency waves. Just as a reminder, the active denial system was a weapon designed by the US military, meaning this failed weapon was your tax dollars at work. But this was nothing compared to the next failed weapon. It could literally blow off the user's head. Albert Bacon Pratt received patent number 1183492 for a miniature cannon that was mounted onto a helmet. This seemed like a great idea to Pratt, and he even managed to get others on board. But in hindsight, the idea of mounting a gun to someone's head is full of problems. The firing mechanism was ingenious and weird at the same time. In order for the wearer to fire the weapon, all they needed to do was blow into a tube. The reason Pratt was so gung-ho about the idea was it allowed the wearer to subconsciously aim at their target just by looking at them. All the soldier needed to do was turn his head and blow. The real strange thing was that Pratt saw multiple applications for his helmet gun. He claimed it could be used in the kitchen. The whole contraption doubled as a cooking pot, with the barrel of the gun being used as a handle. Regardless of how many uses Pratt's helmet gun had, there were too many drawbacks to make the gun a feasible option. Pratt claimed the strong spring that loaded the next round into the barrel counteracted the recoil of the bullet being fired. However, this might have been over-exaggerated, as some claim the recoil was strong enough to snap the head of its wearer. Also, there was that problem of jamming. The only way to fix the problem was by taking the entire helmet off your head and then taking it apart, and heaven forbid the round exploded in the chamber. This scenario would have quickly ended the user's life. During World War II, the Allies would try anything that they thought might help defeat Hitler, even if it was as crazy as strapping rockets to the wheels of a giant bomb delivery system. As the Allies prepared to launch an offensive off the coast of France to reclaim mainland Europe from the Axis powers, 
The scientists at Britain's Directorate of Miscellaneous Weapon Development came up with a crazy idea. They would break down Hitler's walls and defenses by ramming 4,000 pounds of explosives connected to two 10-foot-tall metal wheels. This weapon would be called the Great Panjandrum. The wildest part about the whole thing is how the wheels would move. In order to get the 4,000 pounds of explosives moving fast enough to ensure it would reach the wall before being intercepted, the British scientists attached rockets to the wheels. These rockets would allow the Great Panjandrum to move at 60 miles an hour. The main problem with this weapon was that if just one of the rockets failed, the Great Panjandrum would start spinning in circles or go wildly off course. As the test runs continued, the engineers believed they could solve the accuracy problem by adding more rockets to compensate for any that failed. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, the rockets started ripping themselves off the wheels and shooting across the testing field. This happened multiple times, almost killing the observers of the tests. It was decided the Great Panjandrum would be too much of a liability in the field of battle and was discarded. Throughout the history of warfare, there have been a series of delivery methods for dropping bombs. However, there are a few that you probably never knew existed. In World War II, a surgeon named Lytle Adams came up with the odd idea of attaching bombs to animals. His plan was to fasten little bombs to bats and have them infiltrate enemy bases. The bats would then roost in the buildings and the timed bombs would go off, bringing the structure's roof crumbling down. Bats seemed like the perfect delivery method since they can carry more than their body weight in cargo, they're plentiful, and they can be relatively cheap to breed if more are needed. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt was so intrigued by the idea that he gave it the go-ahead, and the bat bombs were tested. The military collected hundreds of Mexican free-tailed bats and recruited Louis Pfizer, the inventor of napalm, to design the detonation packs that would be secured to the creatures. As the war progressed, United States Command realized that the bat bombs would work exceptionally well in Japanese cities where many of the structures were made out of wood, cloth, and paper. This meant that once the bat bomb detonated, it would not just destroy the structure itself, but could cause a fire to sweep through an entire neighborhood. Luckily for the bats, this project was never implemented. During a test in Carlsbad, New Mexico, one of the bat bombs got loose and sought shelter under a fuel tank at the military base. Later that day, the bomb went off, blowing up the bat and everything else in the vicinity of the fuel tanker. After several failed training exercises and the deployment of the atomic bombs in Japan, the bats were retired from military service as they were no longer needed. The Japanese had their own bomb deployment system, and that was as big of a failure as Adams' bat bombs. However, it did lead to the only deaths in the continent US as a result of an enemy weapon. In 1944, the Japanese deployed 9,000 fugos, or fire balloons, over the Pacific Ocean. Attached to each balloon were a 35-pound high explosive and eight firebombs. The Japanese military planned for the balloons to float along the jet stream until they reached the coast of the United States, where they would descend and detonate. The ideal situation for the Japanese would have been the fugo creating massive wildfires, sending the west coast into chaos. The crazy thing is that around 389 balloons made it to the United States, which is a small number compared to the amount launched, but still not insignificant. When the balloons landed, almost all of them failed to detonate or cause any damage. In fact, two of the Fugos actually floated back to Japan and fell on their own island. Sadly, one Fugo did find its way to Oregon, where it fell to the forest floor. Five kids and a pregnant Sunday school teacher came across the Japanese bombs right as they went off. Everyone in the group was killed, making it the only place on the American continent where death resulted from enemy action in World War II. However, killing five kids and a Sunday a school teacher and her unborn baby was not the outcome that the Japanese had hoped for with their 9,000 fire balloons. They were quickly retired as failed weapons, and a year later, Japan surrendered, ending World War II. The weird Nazi weapon called the Windkanona literally blew so bad that it was deemed an utter failure. Windkanona translates to wind cannon in English and wasn't one of the Nazis' brightest ideas. The way the cannon was supposed to work was rather simple. The 35-foot-long metal tube would be filled with a mixture of hydrogen and ammonium and ignited. This would build up immense pressure inside of the tube that, when released, would send a shockwave of air up into the sky. The hope for the Nazis was that the shockwave would hit Allied planes overhead and knock them out of the sky. In trials, the Windkanona seemed promising, as it could snap wooden planks from 650 feet away. However, when aimed at airplanes moving hundreds of miles per hour in the sky, the wind cannon quickly became less effective. Even though on bombing runs planes dipped as low as 500 feet, the wind cannon shockwave would barely register as more than a slight turbulence to the pilots. The compressed air didn't seem to bother the metal airplanes that were built to withstand different pressures and choppy air when flying. 
Because of this failure, the Nazis decided to repurpose the wind cannon and use it on the ground to push away ground forces, but this too ended in disaster. The weapon was so large it was easily spotted from the air. This made it a perfect target for bombing runs or artillery strikes, which would have devastating consequences. The wind cannona was such a failure that the Allies didn't even know what the contraption was supposed to be used for until they stumbled across one at a Nazi training facility in 1945. It was there that the Allies' intelligence got a close look at the wind cannona and finally realized what the purpose of the failed weapon was. The Germans also developed a weapon with an easily identifiable purpose. The Krumlauf was a machine gun with a slight twist. That twist just happened to be in the barrel. The Krumlauf was a barrel attachment to the Sturmgewehr 44 machine gun. It was supposed to allow a soldier to shoot around corners without exposing himself to enemy fire. The Krumlauf was also designed to be used by soldiers in tanks. They could stick their Krumlauf out the small holes and fire their gun to fend off enemies placing mines in their path or armed with anti-tank weapons. This might have seemed like a good idea, but the weapon came with all sorts of problems. It should come as no surprise that the barrel did not last long, as every time the gun was shot it had to take the full force of a bullet and change its trajectory. This put enormous amounts of strain on the Krumlauf and even caused bullets to shatter on their way out of the muzzle. The shattered bullet would send tiny shards of shrapnel in all directions, making the gun inaccurate and dangerous to friendly soldiers standing nearby. The Krumlauf did not see much combat and was melted down to be repurposed into more useful weapons. And speaking of dangerous projectiles, one United States company manufactured a rifle called the Gyrojet that fired many missiles. In 1960, a company called the MBA Associates developed a Gyrojet to help soldiers hit targets from long distances. The plan was to use projectiles equipped with tiny rockets and a gyroscope to help them maintain their trajectory and course. Once fired, the miniature missile's microjets would kick on, allowing it to accelerate and adjust for wind and gravity. It seemed like a great idea that would make snipers' lives much easier, but the weapon ran into all sorts of problems. Since the projectile's rockets only kicked in once it left the gun, the gyrojet was pretty useless at close range unless it was used as a club. The intricacies that allowed the gun to fire without blowing up required a lot of moving parts. That jammed frequently. This meant the gyrojet was incredibly unreliable, which is not what a soldier wants in their weapons. In the 1950s, the US military thought they were onto something special when they developed a plane that took off straight up into the air like a helicopter. The tail sitter would be a failure, but would pave the way for other successful aircraft like the Harrier jet in the future. The tail sitter was designed in the 1950s by the Navy to fix the problem of airplanes taking off and landing without much runway to work with. They did the best they could with the technology available to them. The tail sitter was a tiny plane with a complex propeller on the front, which allowed it to take off and land vertically, thus eliminating the need for a runway. However, these planes ran into all sorts of problems. Even the most skilled pilots found landing incredibly difficult. Taking off and then moving the aircraft into a horizontal position wasn't quite as bad, but when it came time to put the tail sitter back down on the landing platform, the plane would often tip over. Other times, the pilot would not be able to slow down fast enough, and the back of the aircraft became damaged as it impacted the ground. The military eventually gave up on the tail sitter, and it was deemed a failure. To be fair, the idea for vertical takeoff never totally disappeared, and although the tail sitter never made it to the front lines, many other aircraft based on the same premise have. One Cold War weapon was not only a bad idea but had a terrible name as well. The United States military came up with a satellite that would shoot enemy missiles out of the sky by launching bowling ball-sized pieces of tungsten at them. The unfortunate name given to this weapon was Brilliant Pebbles. It seemed like the Strategic Defense Initiative could have come up with something slightly better or a little more ominous than Brilliant Pebbles for their space-based weapon, but that's what they went with. Brilliant Pebbles was supposed to work by launching a series of satellites into space with several projectiles aboard each. These projectiles could then be shot out of the satellite to intercept enemy missiles flying through the atmosphere. It is unclear what made the researchers think this was a good idea, or that it would even work, but they continued to roll with it. In order for Brilliant Pebbles to have any chance of succeeding, there needed to be at least 4,000 of them in orbit. This would cost astronomical amounts of money for weapons that would most likely miss their targets almost every time. After a good long look at the program, the US military scrapped the idea. It's hard to tell if they were more embarrassed by the weapon's failure or its name. A more recent failed weapon was a type of laser, but this was not just any laser. It was planned to be used while flying through the sky like an X-wing. 
The flying laser cannon, also known as the YAL-1 airborne laser, was mounted on the nose of a plane. It made the aircraft look a little like a dolphin, but that wasn't the worst part about this failed weapon. Its primary purpose was to shoot a high-powered beam out of its laser cannon to destroy any missiles or aircraft in the vicinity. The main problem with the laser was that it required a massive amount of energy to work. All of this power needed to be produced by chemical oxygen iodine laser modules, which are incredibly heavy. The power supply weighed down the entire plane, causing its fuel efficiency and top speed to plummet. In the end, the flying laser cannon was more trouble than it was worth, and the military decided to retire the weapon before it could even be used for its intended purpose of blowing things out of the sky. Guns, tanks, stealth jets, and lasers? The US military has a pretty advanced army, and buried in those vaults are some of the strangest weapons ever invented. Here are the craziest military weapons the army still uses today. Number 20. Atchison Assault Shotgun Everyone knows the positives of a shotgun. They hit like a tank, complete with an earth-shattering sound. The cons? Very limited capacity. That makes it useful for scaring off a daughter's boyfriend or blowing the head off a zombie, but maybe not so much in combat. Military weapons require both accuracy, ease of use, and high capacity, not something shotguns are typically known for. Enter the Atchison. Also known as the Auto Assault 12, this gun is one of the only automatic combat shotguns ever created. It only needs the user to make a quick trigger pull to fire and can fire up to a whopping 300 shots a minute. While this model was designed in the 1980s and has largely fallen out of favor, future designs built on it and combat shotguns are still used today, making them even more useful. The powerful recoil that comes with a shotgun, knocking many an unexpecting user off their feet, is barely present here. It takes the power of a shotgun and combines it with the accuracy and use of a rifle, but sometimes the best way to survive combat is not to be seen. Number 19. Adaptive Camouflage It's hard to get a convoy through enemy territory one wrong move and you could come under attack from dozens of snipers, and staying under the radar is easier when you're not taking massive military vehicles with you. Camouflage has been used by militaries for thousands of years, often as simple as the color of clothing soldiers wear, but disguising something large like a tank is a different story. In 2011 that all changed, as BAE Systems announced an incredible new program that could protect convoys from enemy eyes. But could someone really make a tank invisible? Surprisingly, yes. The adaptive camouflage system was simply surprisingly effective. The sides of the armored vehicle would be covered with around a thousand hexagonal panels that would take thermal images of everything around the vehicle. They would then reflect what was on the other side, creating an image of an area without the vehicle in it. Alternatively, the camouflage could reflect a chosen image, like a harmless car driving through, to eliminate suspicion. The infrared stealth system remains one of the top choices for high-tech camouflage available today. Sometimes what an army needs is strength. Number 18. Hulk No, they're not dropping a green giant guy on the enemy, although that would be pretty effective. The Human Universal Load Carrier was an attempt by Berkeley Robotics starting in the year 2000 to see what a human can do when given a little assistance. Carrying equipment is one of the biggest challenges of the army, and it often makes it hard to travel from one location to another. So, the scientists asked, what if we could increase a soldier's carrying capacity? By how much? How about an inhuman 200 pounds while traveling 10 miles an hour? And all it would take was a simple exoskeleton. The Hulk was designed to fit around the legs and back, providing support and a powered assist while carrying a massively heavy backpack. Powered by batteries, it would run for up to 8 hours while marching and could operate for days with lighter use. While it did perform up to par for weight and none of the troops using it were injured by the weights, the Army wasn't quite satisfied with the freedom of movement it offered, and it could cause strain on muscles. While it's not currently used in combat, interest in the project remains, bringing us all a little bit closer to being Iron Man. In combat, the most important factor is none other than accuracy. Number 17. Precision Guided Firearm in today's army, many of the soldiers are trained marksmen, but many only get basic training, and in the events of a draft, it's likely some would be thrown into combat with only a few weeks of training. That's why today's military is focused on how to take a little of the work off the soldier and onto the gun itself. The Precision Guided Firearm is an upgraded sniper rifle that not only has the traditional tracking scope, but comes with wireless smart technology to pick up data to make it easier to hit your target. And when we say pick up data, we mean all of the data. The most advanced of all these weapons can hack into a local and larger network to pick up data from voice and video all around. The digital scope can also provide visual assistance for locking onto the target, similar to how fighter jets often have precise targeting mechanisms. If this sounds like super spy territory, that's because it is, and many of these weapons can track targets and figure out the best possible vantage point to hit them from, without much input from the man behind the scope. But what if it wasn't just the gun that was smart? Number 16. Smart Bullets 
precision-guided munitions are not new. Missiles and torpedoes are often equipped with guiding mechanisms that can not only just lock onto targets but change their trajectory if the target moves. In 2008, the Exacto program at DARPA switched their strategy from focusing solely on smart guns, developing bullets that can have the same abilities. The earliest model would illuminate the target with a laser designator and the bullet would be keyed to follow that. It would be able to track targets up to a mile away and change position 30 times a second. But modern designs might be even more advanced. The research into smart bullets is ongoing, and Dr. Roland Barrett developed a model that would have three fiber optic eyes around it for tracking. Other designed bullets would be able to be controlled by radio waves or travel around corners automatically without needing to be fired from a curved barrel. These weapons are still in development, and the biggest roadblock in their way? Money. After all, most soldiers will only use one gun but a lot of bullets, and making every one of them a smart bullet would involve a lot of technology. Maybe time to send those bullets through community college instead. Sometimes, though, you need non-lethal weapons. Number 15. Taser Shockwave A stun gun can be a useful way to neutralize an enemy without killing or seriously hurting them, like when you need them coherent for interrogation. But that becomes a lot harder when the person is part of a large group of enemies, and they're all coming right at you. They're probably going to overwhelm you before you get the chance to fire the taser more than once, and that's if you don't run out of charge. But what if you could fire 10 tasers at one time? That's the question the mad scientists at the Taser Corporation decided to answer, and the resulting weapon was amazing if not exactly practical. Meet the Taser Shockwave, a battery of stun guns attached to cables and loaded into a launcher. When triggered, the tasers shoot out and deliver powerful shocks to just about anyone they hit. It might look like a mini-headed dragon, but it's effective at incapacitating attackers quickly and in large numbers, if it hits the target. Accuracy isn't really its strong suit, and in a combat situation there's no guarantee it would hit its target. Taser continues to refine the weapon, and some think it might be more suited to crowd control than combat. And sometimes, you need weapons in the most unusual circumstances. Number 14. Heckler & Coke P11 You're on a submarine, and you get an alert. A saboteur is trying to sink you. You get into the water to engage, but there is just one problem. Your gun isn't equipped for firing underwater. Ordinary rounds lose range and accuracy when fired underwater. Fortunately, you're armed with the Heckler & Coke P11, one of the best underwater pistols ever developed. It's short and stubby, looking more like a checkout scanner than a gun, but it packs a punch. But the surface isn't the only thing that makes it different. The P11 only has five barrels as opposed to the usual six. It fires steel darts rather than traditional bullets, but they can still tear through the enemy. And rather than being traditionally fired, it uses a battery pack in the grip. Also, don't use it recklessly. It can't be reloaded by users and has to be returned to the factory for more ammo. This isn't a weapon that's used too often unless we wind up fighting an army from the lost city of Atlantis, but its secrets are well kept. So well, in fact, its manufacturer won't comment on it. Sometimes the military goes small, and sometimes they go big. Number 13. Electromagnetic Laboratory Railgun The U.S. Office of Naval Research is not a place you get into easily. This is where all the prototypes of the most advanced weapons in the military's stable can be found, but one of them has the potential to be one of the deadliest weapons ever created, taking an already powerful tool and supercharging it with modern technology. A railgun is a massive weapon that fires projectiles at rapid speed and would be one of the most powerful weapons in the U.S. arsenal without needing the equipment for traditional firing. So, what is the secret of this massive prototype? Instead of chemicals designed to ignite explosions, this railgun would fire projectiles entirely using magnetic fields and electricity, and they would travel faster and hit harder than any bullet currently available, up to a whopping 5,600 miles per hour. This gives the railgun power associated with cruise missiles. It's currently in testing, and the military is optimistic about mounting it on ships soon enough. But to get there, they'll have to perfect the repeated fire capability, because for this gun, it's both quantity and quality and that means a lot more tests. But what if the military didn't need to use humans at all? Number 12. The Fire Scout When troops are in a pitched firefight and they see a helicopter from up above, it usually means one thing. Backup is here. But the powerful defense contractor Northrop Grumman has given a new twist. The helicopter is here to provide support, but that doesn't mean there's anyone on board. The Fire Scout looks almost exactly like a standard military chopper, but you'll see a few differences. For one thing, it doesn't have windows, because there's no one inside to look out of them. The Fire Scout might be the most advanced drone 
drone ever created. It can take off and land independently, provide aerial fire support for ground troops, and has a top-of-the-line targeting system. While it's designed to be used in combat, it's also an effective surveillance tool. It was declared mission-capable in 2019 and took to the skies, although the Navy continues to develop and enhance it. This raises the question, if the smart machines are the wave of the future, which other heavy artillery could soon be roaming the battlefield without any soldiers on board? Naturally, we're about to find out. Number 11. The Black Knight Tanks are the workhorse of the military. These treaded vehicles provide valuable shelter for soldiers, run over enemy lines, and are equipped with powerful guns. There's just one downside. If they take a hard hit, they can be hard to escape from in a hurry, which is why the mad geniuses of BAE Systems ask, what if we had a tank without the vulnerable people inside? Enter the Black Knight, a 12-ton tank designed as an unmanned ground combat vehicle. It looks like an ordinary tank on the surface, but much like the Fire Scout, looks can be deceiving. Let's just say you don't want to be in the way of this drone. It's armed with both a turret-mounted large gun and a coaxial machine gun, runs on traditional Caterpillar diesel engines, and its tractor treads make it ideal for off-road operations. It's operated by remote control, but also can use its computer system to make in-combat decisions, independently of operator input. While it's ideal for missions that are too dangerous to send soldiers into the field, its technology is still a work in progress as the military tries to perfect the wireless communication system. But many people in power think this is the remote tank that might be the wave of the future. The military has developed many non-lethal weapons, some with a devastating impact. Number 10. Phaser it looks like a sci-fi laser gun, and it kind of acts like it too. The Phaser, officially titled the Personnel Halting and Stimulation Response Rifle, is a massive laser dazzler gun designed by the Air Force's research division. It doesn't fire a projectile, but can neutralize an entire field of enemies in seconds by unleashing a massive burst of light that can temporarily blind them. This is a low-intensity laser, which means that the victim should recover quickly, but it can leave an entire field of soldiers stumbling among each other and firing nowhere in particular. So why is this weapon not everywhere yet? It's not that the gun didn't work, it's that the military had to make sure it didn't work too well. Blinding weapons that can cause permanent damage are banned under a 1995 UN protocol, and using them is seen as a crime against humanity, so the military needed to make sure there were no lasting side effects. They also had to give it a really cool name, and someone in the design process was definitely a Star Trek fan. But unlike its namesake weapon, this one only has a stun setting. This next weapon might be the way out of some close quarters. Number 9. The Corner Shot In the 1940s, the Nazi army debuted a new weapon, the Krumlauf, a rifle with a curved barrel that could shoot around corners. It was an innovative solution to a major combat problem, and it was a complete failure, with the bullets getting jammed and damaging the barrel after only a few shots. But over 50 years later, the design might have been perfected, ironically by an Israel weapons designer named Amos Golan. Designed in cooperation with American investors, the corner shot has become a key tool for modern militaries. But technology has marched on since the 1940s, and it shows. Unlike the failed version, this weapon doesn't try to shoot a bullet through a curved barrel. Instead, it mounts to a small pistol on the end of a larger weapon, allowing it to be aimed at the target that can be seen through a periscope lens. And it's not a high-powered weapon, but it's one that makes shooting targets from the safety of cover much easier. And in case you're looking for a little more firepower, it can be equipped with a 40mm grenade launcher that can send rounds flying in any direction you choose, without the risk of blowing up your own barrel. Sometimes it's not about the firepower you pack, but it's about what you see. Number 8. Ivis Soldiers can be armed with the best weapons in the world, but in the fog of war, they're dependent on their own eyesight. If they're caught in smoke or in a snowstorm, their aim might be off, leading to missed targets or worse, friendly fire casualties. This gets even more dangerous when the enemy releases vision-clouding weapons, letting them get the drop on the soldiers, which is why teams in the United States Army are working on a unique new headset, one that will not just clear their vision but plunge the soldiers into a new world. Are our soldiers ready for virtual reality? The Integrated Visual Augmentation System, or IVAS, is an augmented reality headset that eliminates visual fog and provides soldiers with a unique array of image options. This includes a thermal setting, so soldiers will be able to see hidden enemies. It also can filter out interference and let soldiers focus on what's important. The headset is in final testing, and the Army plans to use it both as a field tool and a training tool, with soldiers able to engage against virtual enemies in the headset. Maybe exclusive headset video games will soon make some 
and pro gamers sign up for the service too. It's not the only field where the military is working on what sounds like science fiction. Number 7. Quantum Stealth Guy Kramer comes from Canadian innovation royalty, being the grandson of the man who invented the first walkie-talkie, but he might be looking to outdo his granddad by cracking a concept H.G. Wells invented in fiction over a century ago. How do you turn someone invisible? The military has been working on a vehicle camouflage for a while, but options for mobile soldiers are much limited. That's where Quantum Stealth comes into play. A long-term project between Kramer's company HyperStealth and military officials in both Canada and the USA. So, what's the secret to his innovation? The keys to Quantum Stealth are being kept close to the military's chest, but what we know is that Quantum Stealth uses lenticular lenses, the same technology seen in 3D movie posters. The lenses refract light according to the angle they're viewed at, and the way that they're arranged creates dead spots where the object is invisible. But the background is. While it doesn't render the subject completely invisible and can create a blurry spot, it's more than effective enough to confuse a soldier observing from a distance, so it's no surprise the government is investing heavily in the technology. But sometimes you need an earth-shattering kaboom. Number 6. XN1 Laws Unleash the Death Ray Laser weapons are part of science fiction lore, but the US government doesn't want to destroy any planets with them, we hope. The advantage of lasers is that they use a simple powered device and don't rely on ammunition, so they can deliver more than one hit in quick succession. The XN1 Laws was developed by the US Navy and first deployed for field testing in 2014, and the USS Ponce was the lucky ship to get to fire it first. It uses an infrared beam launched from a laser array to hit flying and sea-based targets. So how does it work? For one thing, it's highly energy efficient, needing only an energy pulse to fire and none of the equipment. It can also be adjusted for power, being useful for temporarily blinding enemies at the lowest level. But when it's dialed up to the maximum level of 30,000 watts, it can deliver a massive punch. Not only can it target motors and fry sensors, but it can detonate explosive material on an enemy boat before it reaches its target. It might not be able to blow up enemy battleships from afar, but it's the most effective laser weapon yet. And when it comes to non-lethal attack, sometimes Sometimes things get… weird. Number 5. LED Incapacitator The enemy is advancing, and the only thing that will defeat them is… a flashlight? Well, not just any flashlight. The LED Incapacitator is one of the oddest weapons designed by the Department of Homeland Security's Innovation Research Office, and it's largely designed for use at border crossings and other locations where confrontations with suspicious individuals who might be carrying contraband are likely. Rather than using a traditional weapon, this weapon unleashes a series of random pulses of multicolored light, which switch frequencies often and cause pressure on the brain, and the effects can be… messy. The first symptom is a severe headache, and subjects can experience temporary blindness because their eyes can't adjust to the flashing lights. But they also can't focus, become disoriented, and are hit with a wave of nausea, which is why this weapon has earned the nickname, the Puke Ray. It's largely an effective weapon against individual targets, but some subjects have been proven largely immune. While it hasn't been deployed everywhere due to concerns over its effectiveness, the odds are it would at least be a useful distractor. But that's nothing compared to what this next non-lethal weapon does. Number 4. Active Denial System The US military and defense contractor Raytheon wanted a way to maintain perimeter security and crowd control without having to rely on live fire, and they developed an option that comes out of science fiction. Known as the ADS, it works by firing an energy beam of similar wavelength to the way a microwave oven works. But instead of heating up your frozen burrito, the ADS is going to heat up you. It activates the water and fat molecules in the skin, suddenly heating them and creating a painful effect that sends anyone hit with it running. But surely, microwaving people can't be ethical, right? While the technology is scary, the effects have been minimal. A microscopic percentage of those affected develop minor burns and blistering, while most retreat from the painful sensation without suffering any obvious injuries. While the device could seriously hurt someone if focused on them, the device is intended to protect perimeters and deter people from entering, meaning they'll have the option to run away as soon as they feel the heat. Authorities are now exploring deploying it in both theaters of war and as a way to keep prisoners from escaping over the fence. This next weapon raises the question, is James Bond becoming real? Number 3. The Armatix IP-1 This weapon doesn't look like much, it's just a standard handgun. But if the agent carrying it gets attacked and disarmed, the enemy grabs their gun, they'll be in for an unpleasant surprise. Because it doesn't matter how many bullets are in the chamber, that gun is not firing. The Armatix IP-1, developed by a famous German firearms manufacturer, is notable for being one of the most advanced smart guns in the world. Not only is it optimized to be safe and easy to fire and equip with a camera, but it can only be fired by its authorized user. And it pulls that off with an unassuming accessory. 
The Armatix IP-1 comes in two parts, the gun and the wristwatch it's linked to. It might look like a standard accessory, but it's actually an RFID system that communicates with a handgun and can wirelessly affect it when within 10 inches. If the gun is separated from the watch wearer, it becomes a paperweight. This is one watch battery you don't want to run out, so it indicates the charge on both parts, and it comes with a targeting system that can identify and only fire toward the assigned target. It's not a surprise that this gun is not only being considered for classified missions, but many people want some of its features added to standard guns. But what's the ultimate frontier in combat? It just might be droids. Number 2. Modular Advanced Armed Robotic System What's better than armed combat vehicle drones? How about an armed robotic soldier that can head into battle instead of humans? We might be a long way from the cyborg wars, but that hasn't stopped the Defense Department from dreaming big. They've been experimenting with combat robots for a while, and the current models are more advanced than ever. Coming soon to a battlefield near you, the Mars, a nearly 400-pound robot armed with sensors, weapons, and cameras, and it's packing more firepower than any human could carry. How much? How about a machine gun? Four grenade launchers, the capability to fire non-lethal gear like tear gas, as well as a laser dazzler and a loudspeaker for communicating safely with the enemy. For non-combat missions, the Mars can be equipped with the ability to carry up to 120 pounds. While some combat robots are designed for artificial intelligence, the Mars is more analog, controlled by an operator at base like a drone. But it doesn't need to be a smart robot, it's got enough brawn to make up for the brains. But there's one more robot in the field that might take you by surprise and make you say, What a good boy! Number 1. Robot Dogs A battlefield is stressful enough, but imagine seeing a large four-legged animal approaching you. It looks kind of like a dog, but the proportions are off and it's moving fast. This isn't some weird desert beast, it's one of the military's most popular innovations, the Big Dog. This four-legged military robot was developed by Boston Dynamics and DARPA in 2005 for equipment carrying purposes, essentially replacing the pack mules of old. Its four-legged system would let it overcome rough terrain and each one would have a complex onboard computer. But sometimes reality defeats innovation. The Big Dog project didn't work out for carrying military equipment because they were too loud for combat. Turns out all those moving parts aren't quiet. But this wasn't the end of the project. While the original shut down in 2015, a smaller all-electric model with a lower carrying capacity was soon introduced. And many current models are being equipped not just with carrying capacity, but with non-lethal defense capabilities. That means these robot dogs have a bite and they might just be coming to a city near you. In war, there's only one rule, win. Well, actually, that's not true, or at least not true anymore. In the aftermath of World War II, 196 nations ratified in whole, or with some reservations, two additional treaties to the Geneva Conventions, detailing the basic rights of wartime prisoners, establishing protections for the wounded and sick, and protecting civilians caught on a war zone. The conventions also laid down the framework for the international banning of certain weapons of war, which we'll look at today in this episode of the Infographic Show, Top 10 Banned Weapons of War. War is dirty business, and in the aftermath of the First World War, the nations of the world moved to limit the scope of its destructive impact. Horrified by the mass casualties inflicted by chemical gas attacks, in 1925, at the initiative of the United States, France, and Poland, the League of Nations drafted the Protocol for the Prohibition of the Use in War of Asphyxiating, Poisonous, or Other Gases, and of Bacteriological Methods of Warfare. In essence, international law forbade the use of chemical or biological weapons in war. Since then, other weapons have been added to that list, all with the intent purpose of limiting human suffering or damage to the Earth itself. Without further ado, here are the top 10 banned weapons of war. Number 10, mustard gas. First synthesized in 1822, it wasn't until 1860 that the dangerous properties of mustard gas were documented. As a chemical weapon and dubbed the king of the battle gases, mustard gas is surprisingly the least lethal of all the various chemicals that were used in World War I, and it's estimated that only about 1-5% to of the people exposed to it were killed. Mustard gas's real power lay in the terror it could sow among enemy troops, as well as the incapacitating effect exposure had on unprotected soldiers. Inhaled into the lungs, it could be fatal, but while a gas mask would protect from inhalation, there was nothing soldiers could do to protect their exposed skin. The effects of exposure were not immediate, but within hours, the skin would begin to blister, specifically in moist areas such as the armpits and genitals. As the blisters popped, they would often become infected, which is where mustard gas became one of the most lethal gas weapons ever used. Infection typically kills more soldiers in war than actual combat does. Worst of all, exposure created sensitivity, and further exposure at even lower doses would cause a reaction. 
Number 9. Chlorine Gas Another of the gases used extensively in World War I, it was first deployed by the Germans at Ypres on the 22nd of April 1915. Though an 1899 treaty had forbidden the use of gas in war, the Germans sidestepped the wording in the treaty by releasing the gas from canisters, not projectiles as outlined in the treaty. Planning to release the gas from their own lines, the Germans waited until the wind turned towards the French forces and then let the heavier-than-air gas drift across no man's land and sink into the French trenches. The attack was successful and 100 French troops were killed. Chlorine gas irritates the eyes, nose, lungs and throat and in high enough concentrations can fill the lungs and kill by asphyxiation. Though seen as a horrific weapon of war, the Germans argued that the intent was to actually shorten the length of the war and thus limit overall suffering. Number 8. Phosgene Gas Mustard gas may have been dubbed the king of the battle gases, but when it comes to sheer lethality, no other gas used in World War I could top phosgene. Colorless and smelling like moldy hay, not an uncommon smell in the trenches of Europe, most troops did not realize they had even been exposed to phosgene until it was too late. A slow-acting gas, victims' lungs would fill with fluid and after a day or two would suffocate to death. No treatment existed at the time, and the best a medic could do is make victims comfortable. Although the Germans were the first to use phosgene, it became the weapon of choice for the Allies and would ultimately be responsible for 85% of the 1.2 million casualties of chemical warfare during World War I. Number 7. Nerve Gas In 2017, 100 people, including children, were killed in a nerve gas attack in Syria by pro-government forces, with hundreds left injured. An independent investigation later identified the culprit as sarin gas, a highly lethal nerve agent. Banned by international treaty, nerve agents are some of the most lethal forms of chemical warfare weapons and work by disrupting the ability for nerves in the body to transmit chemical messages between each other. Colorless, tasteless, and odorless, the first sign of exposure is uncontrolled drooling from the mouth, followed by foaming. Nausea and stomach cramps follow, along with uncontrollable urination and diarrhea. Eventually, the victim's lungs become paralyzed, leaving them unable to breathe. Number 6. Plastic Landmines Landmines have been around for centuries, albeit in very crude fashion. Some of the first ever used were by the Chinese during the Song Dynasty against an assault by the Mongols. Filling cast iron cannonball shells with gunpowder, they had an extremely long fuse which had to be lit by hand by brave ambushers just hundreds of feet away from the enemy. Modern landmines are completely autonomous and can vary in tripping mechanisms from pressure-sensitive triggers to tripwires. With the advent of the metal detector, landmines were designed using plastic in order to avoid detection. However, they were quickly banned internationally due to the difficulty in locating fragments via x-ray by treating physicians. This would cause prolonged suffering and was ultimately seen as inhumane. Number 5. Biological Weapons Though around for nearly the entire time that man has waged war against itself, biological weapons were only recently banned under international law. Most biological weapons take the form of weaponized disease agents such as bacteria and viruses, but they can also include fungi, toxins, and rickettsia, parasites that normally affect arthropods but can be deadly in humans. Modern conventions don't just protect people from biological weapons, but actually prohibit their use against plants and animals as well, preventing nations from engineering plagues that can wipe out a nation's livestock or crops and thus creating famine, which is seen as unnecessary human suffering. Number 4. Flamethrowers Made famous for their use in World War II in Vietnam, flamethrowers were the answer to combating enemies entrenched inside fortified bunkers or underground tunnels. In these confined spaces, flamethrowers can actually be more lethal by sucking the oxygen out of the atmosphere than from their actual flames. While technically not illegal, their use around civilian areas has been banned due to the incredible damage they can inflict on infrastructure and their inability to be properly aimed. Number 3. Napalm Another weapon made famous by the Vietnam War, napalm was actually developed in 1942 at Harvard University. As a mixture of a gelling agent and some kind of fuel such as gasoline, napalm was originally designed to be used as an incendiary device against buildings, but was later primarily used as an anti-personnel weapon. As the sticky substance sticks to the skin, it produces severe burns, and sharing in many of the same characteristics as a flamethrower, it can also make it impossible for individuals to breathe. Though not outlawed for military use, its use in civilian population centers is illegal, once again due to their propensity for incredible property damage and inability to fully control its effects. Number 2. Poison Bullets Early bullets weren't very accurate or powerful, so militaries around the world would spike them with small amounts of poison or fecal 
lethal matter. While not adding any immediate lethality, a poison bullet could deliver toxic compounds deep into the body and result in serious infection that would set in long after a battle took place. In modern projectiles, the addition of poison would be largely pointless as well, as modern bullets are already devastatingly powerful. Because of the lack of immediate lethality and suffering caused long after a conflict is over, poison bullets have long been banned by international law. And finally, number one, dirty bombs. Nuclear weapons are bad enough, and the international community has been unsuccessfully trying to ban them since their inception. Nuclear weapons are primarily designed to destroy military or civilian targets, yet to achieve maximum explosive impact, they are detonated high above their target where the pressure wave can spread. This has the side effect of causing most of the radiation released to be harmlessly blasted up into space or dispersed over a very wide area, limiting its effect. A dirty bomb, however, is a device that is designed primarily to create radiological fallout rather than kill outright, with the goal of poisoning land, sea, and air for a very long time. A regular nuclear weapon can be converted into a dirty bomb by simply programming it to detonate at ground level, thus creating massive plumes of radioactive debris and irradiating dozens of square miles. However, other devices, such as a cobalt bomb, can be detonated high up in the air and produce tremendous amounts of radioactive fallout. These dirty, or salted bombs, have long been banned due to the long-lasting and catastrophic damage they do to large swaths of the environment. Man has waged war since his inception, but it's only in the last few centuries that we've begun to try and limit the scope of the destruction that we inflict on each other. As technology progresses and makes more apocalyptic and destructive weapons available, perhaps it's a sign of hope that even the most embittered enemies, such as the Soviet Union and the USA, have abided by these international laws. Maybe one day, we can even move to outlaw war altogether. World War I might have signaled the dawn of a true revolution in military hardware, but it was still filled with some of the craziest and weirdest weapons ever seen on the battlefield. And one American weapon was so terrifying that Germany threatened to execute any POW discovered with it. Tsar Tank, Russian Empire. Our first weird weapon of World War I never actually made it to the battlefield, but it was so weird and would have been so terrifying that it deserves a mention. In the years before World War I, militaries around the world were starting to put the internal combustion engine to the test in an attempt to develop awesome new weapons of military might. Russian engineer Nikolai Lebedenko, however, might have had the absolute craziest idea of them all. In essence, Lebedenko invented the Ferris Wheel from Hell, a massive tank far outsizing even the largest tanks of World War II, which instead of using tracks, was driven by two massive wheels, with a third smaller wheel to stabilize it in the rear. The idea first got the attention of the Russian Tsar when Lebedenko made a tiny prototype with a spring motor, which he wound and then let loose in front of several thick books. The tiny tank managed to climb the books with ease, thoroughly impressing the Russian leader. Almost immediately, he authorized the equivalent of tens of millions of dollars for research and development. In theory, the Tsar tank solved the problem of trying to move a vehicle through a battlefield with a brilliantly simple solution. Make wheels big enough that they can climb over any obstacle. Thus, the tank had two massive wheels out in front extending off two separate arms. In the rear, a third arm ended in a much smaller wheel which would help stabilize the vehicle. The body of the tank would be thin and vertical much unlike anything we might think of as resembling a traditional tank, and would have multiple levels where soldiers could fire cannons and machine guns. With the Tsar's funding, the Russian army built a single prototype in 1914. Two 250 horsepower engines powered each of the massive wheels, but all that power was delivered very inefficiently to the wheels, resulting in a loss of capability. More critically, however, was the miscalculation concerning the rear unpowered wheel. Because of the way weight was distributed on the massive tank, the rear wheel ended up bearing too much of the vehicle's weight, which resulted in it frequently becoming stuck. Even more practical concerns plagued the prototype, though, such as the fact that the tank crew's fields of fire were severely limited by the dual massive wheels out in front of the vehicle, which were themselves extremely vulnerable to being damaged by enemy fire. The prototype saw a single demonstration, during which it became stuck. And just like that, the Russian Ferris wheel from hell was cancelled forever. In our opinion, the Russians should have stuck with it, and instead of arming the thing with machine guns and cannons, they should have just slapped some giant speakers on it and blasted out nightmarish carnival tunes as the massive tanks careened toward enemy soldiers. World War I might have been the only conflict in human history to use weapons and mass that were obsolete for thousands of years though. Trench Raiding Clubs, Allies and Central Powers Sometimes, progress goes in reverse, and nothing attests to the sheer brutality of World War I than the Trench Club, a weapon borrowed straight from the dawn of warfare. The Trench Club was carried by troops conducting nighttime raids on enemy trenches. Because rifles would cause too much noise, those daring 
Viking raiders needed weapons that could kill quickly and very, very violently. Enter the Trench Club. Literally just that, a club. Soldiers would use them to bash enemy infantry to bits in daring nighttime raids. The goals of these raids was to destroy enemy weapon and supply depots, take prisoners, and gather intelligence, rather than a serious attempt to actually take and hold territory. Thus, raiders would ditch their traditional rifles and pistols, which would give them away, and opt for a more brutal way of killing up close and personal, but very quietly. Trench clubs varied in design and were largely ad hoc weapons. Like something out of the 1979's The Warriors, these clubs would be outfitted with spikes and nails driven through them to enhance their lethality. Boards wrapped in barbed wire or simply embedded with random bits of sharpened metal also made for effective trench clubs. The sheer variety of trench clubs was staggering, and some soldiers opted to go full-on Dark Souls and even craft homemade flails complete with spiked balls. Clubs were excellent weapons for brutal trench warfare, but one American weapon was so effective that Germany threatened to execute any American POW armed with it, the shotgun, USA. Shotguns may seem ubiquitous today, but when Germany came face to face with American troops armed with shotguns, they were so horrified with the results that they'd issued a diplomatic protest against their use. The United States had been using shotguns in combat since 1900, when 200 shotguns were sent to the Philippines to aid US troops in fighting off Moro tribesmen. The Moro warriors would frequently rush American soldiers, forcing them into hand-to-hand -hand combat, where they had the advantage and rifles were largely useless. All that changed with the issuing of the Winchester Model 1897 to US troops. As World War I raged on, American observers kept close tabs on the fighting and quickly learned how brutal trench combat was. They put this knowledge to good use, and when America inevitably joined the fighting, she brought with her soldiers armed with modified Model 1987s, more than ready for savage close quarters combat. These specially modified shotguns had a heat shield that would keep the soldier's hand off the barrel, which would heat up during intense and prolonged firing. An additional modification was to add a bayonet lug on which an M1917 bayonet could be affixed. The barrel was shortened to 20 inches, and soldiers were issued with buckshot ammunition. These trench loads contained nine 00 buckshot pellets, making the Model 1897 a veritable cannon in the tight quarters of European trenches. A modified action which allowed the soldier to keep the trigger depressed while working the action meant that the 1897 could unload its five-round load in rapid succession, which quickly earned it the nickname of the trench sweeper. The weapons were so devastatingly effective that Germany soon launched an official diplomatic protest against America, citing the 1907 Hague Convention on Land Warfare, which forbade the use of weapons designed to cause unnecessary suffering. After careful consideration, Judge Advocate General of the Army Secretary of State Robert Lansing decided the law did not apply to American shotguns. The reply enraged the Germans who threatened to retaliate on any captured American troops found to be wielding shotguns. The U.S. responded by threatening to retaliate in kind against German troops equipped with flamethrowers and serrated bayonets. World War I was largely fought in the trenches, and if you thought trench clubs were insane, wait until you see the next item on our list, Gauntlet Dagger. World War I might have been the most peculiar conflict in human history. On one hand, the fruits of the Industrial Revolution had yielded weapons that changed the face of war forever, such as the machine gun and the tank. On the other, the war still often devolved into the most crude and ancient forms of fighting imaginable, and the Gauntlet Dagger is yet another such example. This weapon consisted of a large metal gauntlet that was worn over the wearer's hand and forearm. The sheet metal protected the wielder from enemy knives and bayonets, and inside of the gauntlet itself was a crossbar that the wielder would grip with his hand. A long metal spike protruded from the end of the gauntlet, which would be used to repeatedly stab one's foes. Hooks on the sides of the gauntlet would allow the wearer to lace it up tightly onto their arm, securing it in place even in the heaviest of fighting. While the weapon would prohibit the use of a rifle, it was a devastating close quarters weapon meant to be used in trench raiding. However, if we had our choice of a gauntlet dagger or an American shotgun, we'd gladly take the latter. With the introduction of the airplane, Allied and Central Power pilots were quick to come up with a very weird but terrifying use for it. Aerial darts, French, Germans, and British. In World War I, the airplane was slowly defining its role on the battlefield. Initially used as an aerial scout, eventually airplanes became armed so they could shoot down other airplanes and enemy airships. Recognizing the potential in a machine that could deliver an explosive payload to the enemy from directly above, airplanes were even fitted with bombs. However, these early airplanes didn't have the power to carry aloft significant loads. The Italians, however, saw a solution.
solution to this problem in 1911 and developed the aerial dart. Weighing far less than a bomb, an airplane could carry several hundred of these wickedly sharp long metal spikes. Stabilized by everything from small fins to feathers, the darts would be used to saturate an enemy formation. The French were the first to use them in World War I, with canisters full of the darts attached to the underside of an aircraft. The pilot would fly very high over an enemy formation and pull a wire which would open the canister holding the darts. The released darts would then begin to fall from tremendous height, picking up speed and energy as they fell. The result was devastating, as the long, thin darts could easily penetrate steel helmets if dropped from high enough and deliver long, thin wounds that penetrated deep and resulted in severe internal damage. Aerial darts would be equipped by both sides aboard their airplanes and airships, dropped by the thousands over enemy lines. One French pilot alone dropped 18,000 darts in a single day in 1915. However, the darts soon grew out of favor with both the Central and Allied war planners. The biggest problem with the darts was that they were completely unguided and largely relied on blind luck to actually strike their targets. Because pilots would have to fly at great heights to ensure the darts gained enough speed to become lethal, their accuracy was greatly diminished. Even when used against enemy airships, the darts simply proved ineffective. Their greatest flaw, however, was the fact that the darts needed to score a direct hit to be lethal, as the darts fell with such speed that they'd embed themselves harmlessly into the soil if they missed. Eventually, the darts were phased out, though they were still in limited use in 1917. Necessity is the mother of invention, and the need to not get one's head blown off led to the invention of the weirdest rifles in history. Periscope Rifle – Central and Allied Powers When World War I began, Germany assumed it would be a brief, bloody conflict. However, both the Central and Allied Powers seriously misunderstood how the machine gun had completely changed the face of war forever. With the ability to put out hundreds of rounds of ammunition a minute, these early machine guns may not have been terribly accurate, but they rarely ever needed to be. Mass infantry charges would be absolutely decimated by machine gun fire, with men cut down in the dozens. Trench warfare was the inevitable result, as the machine gun ground the conflict to all but a complete halt. Troops became stuck in their trenches, unable to undertake any sort of offensive action without overwhelming numbers. The trench war had become so deadly that even lifting one's head up and out of the trench for a quick look could be a good way to get your ticket punched. Both sides employed snipers whose sole job was to demoralize the enemy by taking out any soldier unwary or foolish enough to expose themselves. The periscope rifle was thus quickly developed by inventors on both sides as a way of allowing friendly forces the ability to fire on the enemy without exposing the soldier doing the firing. The rifles varied in design but had very common elements. The rifles would be fitted to a frame of some sort which could be used to prop the weapon up and over the trench. A periscope consisting of a reflective mirror would allow a soldier to look down the weapon's sights even from several feet below. The great weight of the frame also helped to stabilize the weapon, and most rifles would be fitted with specially modified magazines, holding many times more rounds than normal. The weapons were surprisingly effective, and despite their clumsy appearance, could be accurate upwards of a few hundred yards, though modern recreations make it probable that the weapon was only truly accurate up to 100 yards. The weapon was so effective, though, that during the Gallipoli campaign, British forces completely abandoned the use of traditional rifles during the daytime. The inventor of one of the first periscope rifles used by the British was even awarded 100 pounds, about $4,000 in today's currency, after the war by the British War Office for his great contribution to the war effort. The periscope rifle design became so popular that eventually machine guns were modified to operate in a similar manner. Incredibly, even pistols received a trench upgrade, which makes more sense than it might seem at first, considering that sometimes opposing trenches were as close as five yards apart. World War II was undoubtedly the deadliest and most brutal conflict this world has ever seen. Even if massive battles with millions of casualties, genocide, and the mass suffering of hundreds of millions of people were not enough, there were various weapons employed by all sides that magnified the carnage by an immeasurable magnitude. Ethics aside, these weapons are included in this list due to their known ability to cause damage, with a list of theoretical weapons reserved for another time. What makes any particular one of these weapons so terrifying is either through the suffering they caused victims, their effectiveness on the battlefield, or their ability to defeat countermeasures. But without further ado, here are some of the most terrifying weapons of World War II. Kamikazes as the war in the Pacific turned ever worse for Japan, they turned to increasingly desperate measures to stem the tide of the American Navy. Though all sides had undertaken suicide missions by individual pilots in the war to some extent, the Japanese were the ones to employ this horrifying tactic regularly. In October 1944, the American and Allied navies began to face an enemy deadlier than any other encountered before. The premise behind a kamikaze attack was simple. Load an aircraft with as many bombs and explosives as possible, find a high-value target like an aircraft carrier, 
and keep going until you hit it. Though it might seem that kamikazes would have been easy to defeat, you would surely be mistaken. In conventional air attacks, if the flak is too heavy or too many enemy aircraft approaching, pilots concerned with preserving their lives would break off and return to base. This was not the case for kamikazes. What made these men so terrifying was not only the weapon they piloted at US ships at hundreds of miles an hour, but their training before even stepping into the cockpit. Though most of the early kamikazes were already experienced veterans, most of the ones that flew later on were raw recruits, receiving little flight training. These men instead went through intensive religious and ideological classes to further increase their conviction for the cause. That way, by the time they took off for that final time, they were more determined than ever to deliver their deadly payload. Even though the US did develop tactics such as increasing air patrols, building defense in depth with picket ships, and developing better time-delayed fuses, kamikaze attacks were still devastating. During their debut in the Pacific Theater, kamikazes obliterated an American task force, steaming for the Philippines, sinking seven ships, and damaging another 40. These attacks would continue with intensity through the Battle of Okinawa, which saw 36 ships sunk, 386 damaged, and almost 5,000 sailors killed, making it the deadliest battle of the war for the U.S. Navy. The Shu Mine 42 Mines are a great way to deter enemy movement or funnel them into areas where you can bring pre-planned fire on them. They're also an excellent delaying tactic since it forces an advancing enemy to slow down to carefully prod for these devices since, unlike most other mines, the Germans made these mines out of wood. As its name would imply, the Schu Mine was an anti-personnel mine that the German army first developed in 1942. Due to the increasing number of ways to detect and destroy mines, they wanted something that Allied troops could not detect. Additionally, due to the wartime shortages of metal, the Germans wanted to conserve as much as possible. With millions of these mines being produced, the cost savings proved significant for the German war machine. But where the mine really paid off was the fear brought into the hearts of Allied soldiers, hoping not to step on them. The shoe mine was not designed to be an extremely large or complex mine. It was composed of a simple wooden box with a detonator and some explosives. Its primary purpose was to maim soldiers, and the war diaries and official records of Allied troops can attest to their effectiveness. Due to their small size and inability to be detected with a metal detector, the only surefire way to identify these little buggers would be to probe the ground with a knife or bayonet manually. However, such methods proved impractical when the Germans placed them on roads or other areas that Allied troops had to cross under fire. Not wanting to be defeated, some Allied troops came up with ingenious methods to defeat them. The British, for example, came up with an idea of placing a garden roller with metal spikes on the end of it. A brave volunteer would kit up in an early version of a bomb suit and roll this contraption across the battlefield. Whenever it hit a mine, it would blow up and the soldier would keep moving on to the next one. Though this design was eventually not approved for broader use by General Montgomery, it's an excellent example of how such a simple device could defeat every advanced detection system the Allies possessed, causing fear and casualties in its wake. Despite lacking official bodies of research from contemporary accounts, troops noted that this mine, along with the vaunted MG42 and screaming Meany Neville were for guns, were chief among their least favorite things to encounter on the battlefield. US Submarines German U-boats get a lot of credit for World War II, and rightfully so. They sunk almost 15 million tons worth of war material and sent tens of thousands of sailors down to an early, watery grave. However, even though U-boats are more famously known during the war, it was actually the US submarine force that was much more feared, and for a good reason. Immediately following the attack on Pearl Harbor, the first units that struck back were US submarines. President Roosevelt ordered that a campaign of unrestricted submarine warfare would be brought against the Japanese, and the service gladly obliged the order. Pretty soon, without warning, Japanese naval and merchant vessels were being sent to the bottom at an alarming rate. US submarines were so successful at attacking Japanese shipping that by the end of 1944, most submarine commanders reported patrols were increasingly difficult, not due necessarily to enemy action, but due to a loss of targets to shoot. This sentiment can be seen in the data for Japanese merchant shipping losses, with over 8.5 million tons of shipping sunk. Those figures mean that the entire Japanese merchant marine was sunk almost twice over, compared to its starting tonnage at the beginning of the war. Not only did the Japanese Navy and merchant marines fear US submarines, but also their army. During the war, historians have estimated that over 44 Japanese troop ships were sunk. 
with over 33 of those causing over a thousand deaths. Some of the troop ships, such as the sinking of the Toyama Maru, resulted in the deaths of over 5,000 soldiers. In total, tens of thousands of Japanese troops were killed at sea, and the threat posed by submarines was so bad, top army commanders were unsure if they'd be able to reinforce their far-flung Pacific outposts. If sinking the entire Japanese merchant fleet, helping cripple the Japanese navy, and preventing the Japanese army from moving were not terrifying enough, another way that submarines caused even more suffering was through their blockade of Japan. Since so many merchant ships were sunk and so many had to delay their journeys days or weeks to get into Japan, the civilian population suffered immensely. Because Japan is an island nation, it relies solely on imports of raw materials, food, and fuel from abroad to keep it going. However, because of the constant attacks by US submarines, the Japanese war economy greatly suffered, and the blockade was the main cause for every type of shortage possible in Japan. US commanders would remark after the war that US submarines were the most critical weapon at disabling the Japanese economy and war effort. Sarin Gas While many people might be familiar with sarin gas from its use in modern-day war zones in the Middle East, the Germans actually invented it in 1938. During their research to design a better pesticide to kill weevils, German scientist Gerhard Schrader found it created a combination far too deadly for some afternoon gardening when he mixed phosphorus with cyanide. A loyal Nazi, Gerhard took his findings to the German military, who quickly embraced the concoction. After rigorous testing, the military produced around 30,000 tons of the stuff. The sarin gas was then weaponized by putting it on specially designed artillery shells that could hurl the deadly gas at advancing Allied troops. Despite having it available since the beginning of the war, and against his general's urgings to use it, Hitler probably made the only correct decision in his life by not employing the weapon. Though conspiracy theories abound as to why Hitler never used it, especially as he knew the war was lost and had nothing to lose, the matter is probably more pragmatic than someone would think. Many people claim that due to his survival of a poison gas attack in the First World War, he was scarred for life and refused to use it on other people. As anyone with any knowledge of the Holocaust would know, he had no problems using deadly cyanide against millions of victims. Rather, it's likely he believed that doing so would result in a massive retaliation against his military, which, especially with the war going on the way it was, it probably was something he didn't want to risk. For the Allies, it was definitely good that he never chose to employ sarin gas in combat. Sarin gas is a terrible chemical weapon and kills by essentially blocking the nerves in your muscles from speaking with your brain. As a result, you begin to convulse and essentially suffocate to death since your muscles need more oxygen than your body will provide. Additionally, it was in the Allies' favor since when the American and British troops captured stockpiles of the weapon at the end of the war, they had no idea what it even was, much less being able to provide effective countermeasures against it. So even though it never was employed in action, this weapon definitely ranks among the most terrifying weapons of the war due to its potential to be used. Unit 731 Biological Attacks The human experiments and torturous murder of tens of thousands of prisoners are widely known and studied in this infamous weapons facility. Though Unit 731's main complex in northern China has garnered the most attention in Western literature, a little known yet even more terrifying aspect of its methods includes an organized biological weapons campaign designed to defeat the Chinese people. With the war in China raging for over five years by 1941, the Japanese army was looking for ways to turn the tide of the war and crush stubborn Chinese resistance facing them. By this time, the Japanese army had already proved that they viewed Chinese soldiers and civilians as less than human and would resort to any means necessary to defeat them. When researchers with Unit 731 approached army officials with their plans to test a variety of diseases to see which ones were the most effective at causing a pandemic, they happily obliged. After choosing various diseases such as cholera, bubonic plague, typhoid, anthrax, botulism, and dysentery, Unit 731 decided to run live test trials of the effects of these deadly diseases by employing them against the civilian population. Throughout the course of 1941, no fewer than 11 Chinese cities were devastated by these diseases, as they killed tens of thousands and sickened hundreds of thousands more, either through dropping specially made porcelain bombs, crop dusting with aircraft, poisoning water supplies, or purposefully infecting food and clothing headed towards civilian population centers, the Japanese scientists proved their ability to bring biological destruction against their enemies. The army was more than pleased with the results of these tests, and soon ordered detachments of scientists and specially trained army personnel to be distributed throughout their forces in China to be used against the Chinese military as well. 
Though there were many such attacks throughout the war in China, perhaps one of the deadliest and most terrifying was the May 1942 biological attack on Baoshan. Situated near the border with Burma, this area of southeastern China was vital for the Japanese military to control in order to prevent resupply of Chinese forces in the region from the south. After the successful test trials of 1941, the army wanted to start conducting biological warfare operations in conjunction with its conventional military attacks. Between May 4 to May 6, 1942, the city was bombarded by tons of munitions from Japanese planes to include numerous bombs filled with disease-ridden flies. Additionally, troops from Unit 731 poisoned local water supplies with cholera. The Japanese hoped that after the successful assault on the city, the remaining civilians would flee to the countryside and infect their countrymen. To the surprise of the Japanese, it worked better than expected. Within weeks, a full-blown epidemic was ravaging southeastern China. Entire families were wiped out and villages were decimated. This area of China had never once had a recorded cholera outbreak, and this added to the suffering of those exposed who had no natural immunity to the disease. Because of this, by July, some estimates propose that over 200,000 people died. Even though data is scarce and death tolls from the attack range wildly, depending on defining the geographic location and time frame, this attack is still by far the deadliest single biological weapon attack of the war. The U.S. has sent nearly $30 billion worth of aid to Ukraine, with a significant chunk of that being military equipment. The equipment has directly supported the nation's stunning counterattack, with U.S. equipment taking center stage and shaping the battle before it was even launched. Russia is now finding out why the U.S. doesn't have free healthcare. But what equipment has the U.S. sent, and why does it seem like Russia is helpless against it? Javelin a week after Russia's invasion of Ukraine, there was one name the Russian army and the rest of the world had become very familiar with – Javelin. This premier American anti-tank system first entered service in 1996 when it replaced the M47 Dragon and has proven absolutely lethal against Russian armor. This is the weapon US infantry would have used themselves in a war with Russia, and its effectiveness is nothing short of terrifying. The weapon consists of two components – the launch tube assembly and the reusable command launch unit. The clue is the brains of the system and features four times magnification at both day and night with its thermal sight. This system allows U.S. infantry to no longer be reliant on supporting heavy vehicles for target identification, and the clue can be used by itself even when no more missiles are available to provide infantry with a portable and very capable thermal sight. A 12 times magnification narrow field of view option allows gunners to effectively zoom in on a target and properly identify it. When the gunner is ready to fire, he switches to a seeker FOV mode at 9 times magnification. This is effectively now being fed into the missile guidance unit. With target selected, the gunner squeezes a second button and the missile is on its way to deliver 19 pounds of supersonic tandem charge high explosive American Freedom to its target. In order to defeat modern reactive armor, the Javelin missile features two warheads that detonate in rapid succession. The first is a smaller charge, which is meant to blow away explosive reactive armor panels being fired up at the missile in an attempt to disrupt it. The second shaped charge creates a narrow stream of molten metal that penetrates through tank armor to deliver an extremely emotional event to the crew inside. When targeting armored vehicles, the Javelin switches to top attack mode, in which the missile fires straight up into the air and then comes down directly on the tank's thinner top armor. You've probably seen pictures of Russian tanks with what were termed cope cages. These metal cages were being welded onto Russian tanks at the start of the invasion to protect from anti-tank missiles, and in some cases could actually be effective. However, against modern anti-tank weapons, the cages were simply wasted labor, and as St. Javelin took a horrible toll on Russian tanks, the Russian Ministry of Defense quickly sought out a new solution. Nowadays, you're probably not seeing many of these cages on Russian tanks because A, most Russian tanks are now Ukrainian tanks, and B, they didn't work. So why are Javelins so effective against Russian armor? The truth is that modern anti-tank missiles of the quality being supplied to Ukraine are frankly terrifyingly effective. Even Western tanks would be hard put to defend themselves against them, which is why the US is gradually adding the trophy protection system to its own tanks. This anti-anti-tank missile system fires explosive charges at incoming missiles that are more effective at disrupting the weapon than explosive reactive armor panels. However, the real reason why Javelins are pounding Russian armor into scrap metal is that Russia has very poor military doctrine and uses its tanks improperly. Tanks are not meant to operate on their own, but are rather meant to be directly supported by infantry. Supporting infantry forces are responsible for keeping enemy hunter-killer teams at bay, 
Yet, the Russian military has routinely shown that it does not operate armor and infantry together well at all. Often, Russian armor is simply left to fend for itself with predictable results. Kamikaze Drones Odds are you've now become familiar with the names Phoenix Ghost or Switchblade. Russian infantry is not only aware of the names but actively fears them. The Phoenix Ghost drone is a loitering munition developed under the US military's big safari weapons program. This acquisitions program is meant to rapidly deliver new weapons to meet unexpected or evolving threats, allowing the US military to quickly counter enemy capabilities using pre-existing technology rather than going through a whole development and testing cycle of new tech. To date, the US has sent around 700 of these weapons to Ukraine, with a significant impact on the battlefield. The loitering munitions can hover over an area for six hours and conduct surveillance at both night and day thanks to its infrared sensors. Once a target has been detected, the drone kamikazes down onto its head with an explosive finale. The drone is great for taking out entrenched infantry, or even lightly armored vehicles such as trucks. The Switchblade is the name most people are familiar with, and has sort of stolen the Phoenix Ghost's thunder. The weapon was conceived by the US Air Force Special Operations Command as a way of rapidly giving infantry a way to provide their own air support in Afghanistan. Traditional air support may not always be available or take time to respond, plus it can cause serious collateral damage. The Switchblade 300, however, can be carried by individual soldiers and used for both reconnaissance and attack, dropping down from above directly on an enemy's head. When the weapon was first sent to Afghanistan, it was on a test case basis and in limited numbers. In 2012, US soldiers received 75 Switchblades to try them out in real-world conditions. The result of that test remains classified, but very shortly afterwards the US Army made a request that the weapon be immediately made available in far greater numbers. Insurgents soon feared it and US soldiers loved it. Soon after its debut in Afghanistan, the Switchblade was tested from the open bay of an Osprey transport successfully tracking and impacting its target. This paved the way for a new development between Switchblade manufacturer Aerovironment and Kratos Defense and Security Solutions for a high-speed, long-range, unmanned combat air vehicle that could act as a mothership to a host of Switchblade drones. The UCV would be designed to rapidly deploy an overwhelming number of Switchblades in order to overcome enemy defenses. The US has provided over a thousand of both the anti-personnel and anti-armor version of the Switchblade drone which Ukraine has used to devastating effectiveness. In response to the overwhelming success of the Switchblade, Russia has announced development of its own loitering munition, the LAOP-500, which it boasts twice as powerful as the Switchblade. Given the fact that Russia is bringing T-62s out of museums to fight in Ukraine, take that boast with a grain of salt. So why can't Russia stop these American drones? The easiest answer is that Russia simply wasn't prepared for modern warfare. Despite its many pre-invasion boasts of being able to take on even the military forces of the US, Russia has proven it simply has no idea how to fight a modern war. It has failed to conduct large-scale combined arms operations and displayed time and again a complete disregard for electronic and signal security. The devastation delivered by Western-provided smart munitions proves that it fundamentally was unprepared for the consequences of a smart battlefield. The hard answer, however, is that nobody is really prepared for the loitering munition threat posed by modern drones. There is simply no way of providing adequate protection to infantry forces from loitering munitions, though the US has been working on the problem for a few years now. Electronic warfare capabilities meant to disrupt drone signals or even shoot them down with electromagnetic pulse weapons are now being seen as integral to the very structure of the traditional American infantry platoon. So, the next time big, tough US infantrymen go to war, expect to see Geek Squad fighting right alongside them, because without electronic warfare support, infantry is too vulnerable in future conflicts. Stinger At the start of the war, Russian air forces operated in large numbers across the country. By now, Russian rotary aviation is conspicuously absent from the front lines. The reason is the US made FIM-92 Stinger and similar platforms provided by other Western countries. Russian aviation is having traumatic flashbacks to the Afghanistan war, when its helicopters were mauled by US-supplied Stingers. Today the weapon system has been updated but remains relatively the same as it was when liberating communist aviators from their earthly troubles in 1985. The Stinger is a shoulder-fired man-portable air defense weapon or man pad that can engage targets up to 3,800 meters away, making it perfect for taking out low-flying aircraft such as helicopters. Its smart seeker head can differentiate between the exhaust plume of an enemy aircraft and its engines, helping it home in for a successful kill. To fire the weapon, a battery coolant unit or BCU is inserted into the grip stock. This delivers a supply of high-pressure argon gas, which cryogenically cools the seeker to operating temperature. 
This causes the Seeker to be very sensitive to heat sources, thus allowing it to lock on to enemy vehicles with great precision. Once fired, a small ejection motor pops the missile clear of the operator and to a safe range, where the main rocket motor is activated, sending the missile on its way. The warhead is relatively small, only about 2.26 pounds of HTA-3 explosive, a mix of HMX, TNT, and aluminum powder. However, the weapon is designed to directly impact the vehicle's engines, which can be easily damaged or destroyed even with a small amount of explosives. So why is the Stinger once more violently reuniting Russian aircraft with the ground? Once more it comes down to doctrine. Russian forces are doing a poor job of integrating air power with ground forces, leaving low-flying Russian aircraft at great threat from man-portable weapons. However, the real culprit is Russia's basic lack of precision targeting. Most of its ground attack aircraft lack targeting pods meaning they have to come in low for any attack to have a large degree of precision. This puts them directly under the threat of the Stinger. Hi Mars. We couldn't possibly do an episode on US weapons Russia's having a very bad day with and not mention the vaunted Hi Mars system. This thing is not very impressive on paper. The high mobility artillery rocket system is at first glance underpowered rocket artillery. Unlike its more capable cousin, the M270 MLRS, the HIMARS system has half the number of munitions available to it, six GMLRS rockets. It's basically just a truck with a single pot of missiles on its back, so why in the world has this weapon single-handedly changed the face of the Ukrainian war? In the early 1990s, the US Army was retooling itself from fighting World War III against the Soviet Union and its allies to the expected Bush Wars of the future, which would feature low-intensity conflict. This meant the Army needed to slim down and start providing weapons that were mobile and flexible, something traditional rocket artillery is not. HIMARS was developed to meet the need of a light footprint force such as US paratroopers or a small contingent of overseas troops fighting a conflict requiring precision rather than overwhelming firepower. Mounted on a truck, the system has far greater mobility and speed than any of its tracked cousins. And this was a huge draw for a future low-intensity conflict. However, it was exactly this capability that would make HIMARS so valuable to Ukrainian forces. Faced with overwhelming numbers, Ukraine needed a platform that could rapidly deliver a fire mission and then flee before enemy counter-battery fire or air support could respond. Traditional tube artillery would be based around areas in Ukraine, could enact some form of air defense which protected them but made them very inflexible weapons. HIMARS, however, could quickly drive to a launch site, pop off its missiles, and drive away in minutes, allowing the weapon system to be anywhere it needed to be with short notice. But it's HIMARS's precision and range that makes it truly deadly. Each of the six GLMRS rockets have a range of 57 miles and are armed with precision warheads. This gives Ukraine the ability to punch behind enemy lines at targets out of range of traditional tube artillery, which has a range of around a dozen or so miles. But it's the precision that really matters, because each rocket can be programmed to hit a specific target or to double up and defeat enemy fortifications, striking exactly at their weakest point. The error radius of HIMARS is classified but believed to be no more than a few meters at most, and is likely far, far less than that given the history of US smart weapons. With just a dozen of these weapons at the start of summer, Ukraine began to batter Russian command posts and logistics nodes, leading to an immediate effect on the battlefield as Russian forces were slowed to a crawl as they contended with the chaos being wreaked behind their lines. Russia quickly moved to neutralize the weapon, dedicating large amounts of air power and special operations forces to locating and destroying these mobile rocket launchers. Within weeks of the deployment of HIMARS to Ukraine, Russia claimed it had destroyed all of them, yet the US confirmed that not a single HIMARS had been lost in combat. Was Russia lying? Normally the answer to that question would be yes, but in this case they actually might have been telling the truth, at least from their own point of view because the weapon is mounted on a generic heavy-duty truck frame. Ukraine created multiple HIMARS decoys using trucks painted green. Other decoys were mere mock-ups made of wood, and it's confirmed that Russia has destroyed at least 10 of these decoys with caliber cruise missiles. Russia took the bait and expended significant effort and resources better used elsewhere to find and destroy these fake HIMARS, leaving the real HIMARS safe from attack. The US quickly agreed to supply Ukraine with more HIMARS, and the nation now has just under two dozen of these platforms with plans for more to be delivered. As of September 8th, Ukraine has struck 400 Russian targets with the weapons, making it the hardest working weapon in the Ukraine war, and one that has forced Russia to radically rethink how it deploys its forces. No longer safe behind the front lines, Russian command and control nodes and logistics hubs have been forced out of HIMARS range, which means the rate of the offensive has slowed to a crawl as units have to wait even longer for resupply. 
Russia has threatened to retaliate against the United States for further deliveries of the weapon system, but given that it can't handle 16 of these and the US Army is equipped with over 400, it seems Russia's mouth is cashing checks its military can't cash. A deadly shotgun expertly engineered using bedposts and batteries. A powerful and complex crossbow that utilized rubber gloves and toothbrushes. Or what about a potentially life-taking bomb that looked like an innocent magic marker? The ingenuity of prisoners is sometimes nothing short of mind-boggling, as you'll now see in all its bloody glory. Number 12. We're gonna start with something that sounds like fiction dreamed up by a Hollywood screenwriter, but we promise you, every word of this tale is true. It's a story starring a silent killer who got the nickname the meanest man in America. His real name was Donald Henry Gaskins, and yes, he was one mean man indeed. He was also pretty good with his hands. Gaskins was a piece of work if there ever was one, but we won't go into detail about all of his crimes. In short, he lived a life of violent crime and murdered 15 people, although it's possible he could have killed many more. He was sent to prison to serve nine concurrent life sentences and that's when he got creative with weapon building. The reason he did it was because someone on the outside, a man named Tony Simo, wanted another man dead because this other man had murdered his mother and stepfather during a robbery. This killer's name was Rudolf Tyner. In 1982, Simo managed to smuggle in strychnine and cyanide to Gaskins. These substances only made Tyner ill, not dead. So Gaskins and Simo were forced to get more creative. Then, during one visit, Gaskins said to Simo, You get me a damn stick of dynamite, an electric blasting cap, and we'll put that damn thing in a radio so when he turns it on, it'll blow him to hell, and there won't be no coming back on that. Later, during a visit, Simo secretly passed some C4 explosives to Gaskins. Gaskins proceeded to rig the explosives into a cup and put that inside a small radio. He then connected the radio to the lead so the thing looked like part of a walkie-talkie. When it was done, Gaskins approached Tyner and said something along the lines of, Hey, I made this real cool walkie-talkie, and if you take one end into your cell, we'll be able to chat with each other. He added, You're gonna need to put it really close to your ear. And that's what Tyner was doing when Gaskins pulled the cord and detonated the bomb, with the media later saying he pretty much blew Tyner's head off. At the time, Gaskins was said to be rolling around in his cell laughing his own head off. He wasn't laughing so much in 1991 when he was fried in the electric chair. As for Simo, he got eight years in prison himself for contracting the killing, but he thought it was worth it, later saying, I don't feel the good lord holds nothing against me for this. As you'll now see, sometimes you don't need high-tech tools to kill a person. Number 11. You've all heard of shivs. Regular types of knives make made in prison. These things are two a penny, and the problem with shivs is you have to be up close to someone to kill them, or at least wound them badly. So why not make a spear? That's exactly what some prisoners have done in the past, it just takes a bit more patience. But hey, prisoners generally have a lot of time on their hands. What they do is use paper from magazines or newspapers and wet it and constantly roll it and they can make it a tough handle that's sometimes a few feet long. They rip off bits of clothing and wrap that around the handle to make it even more sturdy. The head of the spear is often made from bits of steel that have been taken from a bed. Prisoners have been known to use dental floss and binder clips to cut through beds, which takes a lot of time but can be sped up by using certain powders. It's not hard to find instances when such weapons were used, but a standout case was the murder of a prison officer named Howell Birchfield. On June 8, 1985, he was walking past cells at San Quentin Prison in California when he was stabbed through the heart with what the LA Times described as a spear. That same article talked about a powerful cache of plastic and powder explosives being smuggled into another prison, so we think now we'll talk about bombs again. This one particular bomb being a very strange device indeed. Number 10. On October 31, 1995, a court security officer came across a package at the United States Courthouse in Chicago, addressed to Judge Blanche Manning. The package was put through an x-ray machine and what was seen was described like this. A D-sized battery with two wires hooked to the battery at one end and a cylindrical tube at the other end and two wires leading to a section of the package that was not visible. The courthouse was immediately sealed off and explosive experts were called in. It was soon discovered that the device was what's sometimes called a victim-actuated device, meaning it would only go off if someone opened the package. What's amazing is what the bomb was made out of. The outside looked like a book, but inside the hollowed-out book was a magic marker full of match heads connected to a battery and some cords. As the battery was alive, if someone had opened the package, the bomb would have exploded and very likely caused a grievous injury. The bomb maker was a a convicted murderer named Peter Saunders, a man who later said he had hated the judge due to how his appeal had been dealt with, on top of him not being given what he said was enough medical care. He admitted that he wanted the judge dead, but said he did worry that someone else might open the package and get hurt. While an investigation later revealed that the device would have likely not killed anyone, it certainly might have taken a handoff. As for where Saunders got his bomb-making skills, well, as you'll now see, there's a good reason one name for prison is Crime School. 
Number 9. We can only find one instance of inmates making a flamethrower, but we think it's worth a mention. The story comes from a 1995 newspaper story that involved an interview with C.T. O'Reilly, who at the time was the assistant warden of Darrington Prison in Texas. He said there'd been a problem in the prison, which at first just looked like the prisoners had been drinking a lot of coffee. That's because all that coffee mate was being brought up at an astonishing speed. Not for drinking, though. O'Reilly explained in an interview, the inmates would roll up a piece of paper, put coffee mate in it, put a cigarette lighter in front of it, blow it out, and it's just like a flamethrower. If you think that coffee mate wouldn't work in this regard, think again. It was proven in an episode of Mythbusters that this powder could cause a fair bit of damage once ignited. And so can homemade guns, as you'll now see. Number 8. One of the most simple kinds of homemade guns you can make is called a zip gun, which combines a metal tube and some kind of crude firing mechanism. An expert at making these was Mark de Friest, a U.S. man who was sent to prison on a minor charge but after trying to escape 13 times, with 7 successes, he stayed in prison for 39 years. This Houdini of a man likely suffered from autism spectrum disorder and it made his life hard in prison, which is the reason he so badly wanted to get out. In one escape attempt, he sent a number of officers round the bend after spiking their drinks with LSD. In another attempt, he managed to get his hands on some copper sheets while he was in the prison workshop. His first thought was, man, these guys must really want me to escape. He used the copper top to make a barrel connected to a handle he fashioned out of wood. When the day of the escape came, he sneaked an ice pick into his cell and ripped out one of his teeth. That's how he was able to go see the prison nurse. When no one was looking, he picked off his handcuffs and pulled out his homemade gun, shouting, anybody move and I'll blow your brains out. He fired a shot at the wall just to show how the gun wants the real deal, and after that, took off into the nearby woods. Alas, his escape didn't last long, but he decided it was time to make another gun when he was back inside. He later said in an interview, I was in my gunsmith phase. I could make a gun out of anything. This time, he used an empty tube of toothpaste, although exactly how has not been made clear. In DeFries' own words, he said, there's an art to everything. This time again, he shot at the wall to show how the gun worked, but even though that shot wasn't even close to any officers, he was later charged with attempted murder and spent a long, long time in what's been described as torturous solitary confinement. DeFries was so good at making things that they kept him naked in a dark cell for a long time, not even giving him toiletries or eating utensils. Now let's talk about shotguns and a bit of prison engineering that's frankly outstanding. Number 7. Even Mark de Friest would have been impressed had he heard the story about an inmate making a powerful shotgun from simple things he'd found in prison. It happened at Justizvollzugsanstattzelle in Germany, a prison that's been around since 1710. On May 21, 1984, two inmates there took a guard hostage with one of them brandishing what was and still is arguably the most advanced prison-made gun of all time. Suffice to say, no one does it like the Germans when it comes to engineering. To make the gun, the inmates had utilized two steel bedposts. The charge was made with lead from some curtains, and the explosive came from match heads. To ignite that, AA batteries and a broken light bulb were used. Okay, so that sounds impressive, but did it work? Yes, it did, and we know that because the prisoners fired the gun. After that, they were allowed to leave the prison yard from where they made their getaway in a car. If this story can't get any crazier, the media reported that the guy driving the car was a policeman, and he had bombs tied to his neck. The inmate with the skills was named Peter Strudinger, who was in prison for attempted manslaughter. He and the other guy were picked up the next day and sent back. Although, around one decade later, news reports detailed how Strudinger had escaped again and this time was driving around Germany in a stolen Porsche with a hostage at his side. Again, he'd used a homemade gun to get out. We're gonna stick with Germany for a minute and talk about what has to be the coolest weapon ever created. Number 6. If a vampire hunter had a weapon in his pocket other than his faithful stake, we'd reckon he'd have a crucifix dagger, like the one found in Germany's Wolfenbüttel prison. We don't know much about this story other than the instrument was photographed among a collection of other weapons found in German prisons. This time, no one got out or hurt anyone. We don't know how it was made. We do know that since the dagger partly was hidden within a wood, the potential killer in this case would have looked more pious than dangerous. Number 5. We'll give one last mention to a German-made weapon just because we haven't seen anything like it before. It can only be described as a whip made from razor blades, something that was confiscated in 1996 at Fulsbüttel Jail in Hamburg. The inmate had apparently made it to use on a nurse who refused to give him any more methadone. The next kind of weapon would be funny if it wasn't deadly. Number 4. If you were in prison and you really wanted to hurt someone but you weren't very good with your hands, what do you think you'd do? Perhaps put some batteries or bars of soap in a sock? What about whacking someone in the face with the edge of your food tray? These two things are often the go-to weapons when one doesn't have the know-how to build something better. But we found another kind of weapon that anyone can make. That is, a good old-fashioned water bomb, aka water balloon. 
But before you start laughing, just think how much a large bag filled to the brim with water could weigh. It could weigh as much as 20 kilos, and if you dropped that kind of weight on someone's head from a decent height, there would be a good chance you could kill someone if not hurt them very badly. We could find one instance of this happening at San Quentin Prison in 2011. The water balloon in question was dropped from the fifth floor and hit a guy who was way down on another floor on the top of his head. The article said the victim was taken away in an ambulance with serious injuries and was lucky to be alive. Let's stick with almost amusing stories just for now, and soon we'll get to the most fascinating prison weapon we've seen. Number 3. This is another kind of weapon that anyone could create, and one that would afford a fair bit of enjoyment in the making since it's made out of candy. The candies in question are the notorious Jolly Rancher tablets. Word on the street is prisoners sometimes line up all the candies in a row, then wrap them in aluminum foil. The foil can then be heated and fashioned into a spike, and hey, presto, you have a knife straight out of a brother's grim fairy tale. Not only that, once you've done the deed, you get to slowly enjoy making the hard evidence disappear. It sounds like make-believe, but there's some evidence of it happening from MSNBC's TV show Lockup. In the episode New Mexico Extended Stay, one prisoner had his candy privileges taken away because he'd made those Jolly Ranchers into a shiv. And yes, it's been proven that you could really hurt someone with a Jolly Rancher weapon. If you think you heard about this before, the Jolly Rancher shiv was featured in an episode of the TV prison drama Orange is the New Black. After hearing that, you won't be surprised to hear that prisoners have made nunchucks before. Number 2. In 2011, a guy named Lorenzo Pollard did just that. He was imprisoned at a medium security institution in St. Louis when he decided it was time to get out. All he needed was a weapon. And what better way to break out in style than fighting off a number of prison officers by swinging around a pair of homemade nunchucks? In terms of the creativity and the labor that goes into making a prison weapon, this one's pretty simple. Pollard just broke some bits of wood off a chair and connected them with a part of a bed sheet. He produced the weapon while being taken by officers to the shower block, after which he broke through a window and jumped two stories down to the outside. He got up, outran more guards, and proceeded to scale two razor wire fences. You'd think this guy was a serious criminal on some major charges, but he was actually only in for trespassing, theft, a bit of property damage, and resisting arrest. He should have done his time, because he was picked up and sent back to prison after a few days, now with added charges. Now for the pièce de résistance, the inmate who made a complex crossbow. Number 1. The year was 1998, and one inmate at Canada's Stony Mountain Prison found himself with a lot of time on his hands in a dissociation cell. It seems he did at least have the basic necessities for prison life, out of which he made one of the most brilliant prison weapons in history. That was a powerful crossbow made out of what the prison described as follows. Ten toothbrushes, a cigarette lighter, a section of ballpoint pen casing, a piece of wire coat hanger, a section of a pair of aluminum cafeteria tongs, assorted electrical components, pieces of yellow rubber gloves, some Kleenex, a piece of string, and a few screws. The guy who made it wasn't named and he never actually got to use it, which is probably a good thing since when the staff at the prison tested the device, they watched in shock as it fired homemade arrows 40 feet. The prisoner had made them from tightly packed toilet paper and aluminum foil, and with that excellent crossbow they could have easily killed someone. The crossbow is now on display with many other inferior weapons at Canada's Penitentiary Museum. Ever wonder how crazy World War II was? Well, here's some World War II weapons so crazy you probably never heard of them before. Number 10. The Krumlauf Curved Barrel Rifle In war, you often have seconds to react to an enemy. You turn around the corner and you're met with a barrage of fire that can gun you down before you have time to pull the trigger. But what if there was a way to shoot without turning the corner? The German war machine thought it was possible when they created the Krumlauf, an attachment to the Schrumgewehr 44 rifle. Featuring a periscope viewing device and a curved barrel, the goal was to allow soldiers to see and shoot around corners when shielded. The idea was sound, but there were a lot of issues with the final product. The bent barrel attachments underwent enormous stress every time the gun was fired, as the barrel had to withstand the pressure of a speeding bullet as it curved. They would wear out after only 300 rounds, far from ideal for a tense firefight. Even worse, the bullets underwent pressure as well and could shatter, leading them to come out of the barrel in shrapnel, possibly injuring the shooter or their allies. The mirror of the periscope was also vulnerable to fogging. The designers tried to adapt the attachment with shields and vent holes, but ultimately, the Krumlauf was just… crummy. But it was better for the user than this next weapon. Number 9. The Kamikaze Bomb Kamikaze pilots were a key part of Japan's war strategy, using pilots who deliberately crashed their planes into enemy targets and sacrificed themselves. But they were only as strong as their planes, so the Japanese army decided to give them deadlier weapons. The Yokosuka MXY-7 Oka was the first plane designed for one-way trips, a rocker-piloted, human-guided flying bomb that would be aimed at aircraft carriers. 
It was one of the fastest Japanese planes ever designed and delivered a much bigger punch than the standard kamikaze plane, but it sacrificed function for strength. Because the planes weren't intended to come back, they didn't have the range of other planes, and they needed to be brought near their target by bomber planes which could then be picked off by American forces before the MXY-7 could hit its target. When they did hit their target, they did serious damage, but rarely enough to sink major US vessels. They were mostly used in an attempt by the Allies to retake Okinawa, and their impact was minor. The Japanese tried to refine it to make it stronger and more effective, but time ran out and the war ended. The next item struck fear into the enemy, but that's about all it did. Number 8. The Gustav Rail Cannon The soldiers defending the French Maginot Line hear a massive rumble, and soon over the hill a monstrosity appears. It's a rail cannon almost impossibly large, 150 feet in length, with a barrel of 100 feet alone. It looks like a metal dinosaur, and it roars like one as well. It fires the heaviest artillery shells around, and its range can hit targets from far larger distances than other guns. This is the Schwer Gustav Railway gun, and its image struck terror into the hearts of the Allies. But the reality was far more complicated. Hitler liked big menacing weapons and was quickly won over by the Gustav's impressive design. The military command was less impressed. Yes, the Gustav delivered a powerful punch, but the effort needed to operate it was massive. It needed to be transported in parts and assembled and mounted on site, which took 4,000 soldiers. And it was so expensive to build that the Nazis deployed anti-aircraft units to defend them. It's not a surprise that only a few were ever created. The investment wasn't worth the result. But the Nazis had another weapon that was much smaller, but no less deadly. Number 7. Goliath Tracked Mine Landmines are one of the most feared weapons of war, being buried and waiting for an enemy soldier or tank to go over them and then blowing them to bits. But what if the mines weren't sitting ducks? What if they could come for the enemy? Research was ongoing since World War I as German engineers experimented with small tracked vehicles that could be remote controlled to deliver bombs. Early attempts failed, but later versions were equipped with high explosives of up to 220 pounds and could be sent to target tanks. But there were some major downsides to these new weapons. First, they were single-use devices, similar to kamikaze planes but without the living pilot. Second, remote control technology was still rudimentary and steering wasn't particularly accurate, meaning the best strategy was simply to aim them and hope for the best. Third, they were expensive to produce, and while over 7,500 were produced, they were too big and unwieldy to be effective weapons. They're an interesting artifact of the war, but armies found it much more effective to stick to traditional mines. Other attempts to replace landmines were much more controversial. Number 6. Mine Dogs One of the most vicious battlefronts of the war was Russia, where German tanks were invading after betraying their former ally. The Russians were suffering heavy casualties and were outgunned by the Nazis' superior firepower, so they turned to an unconventional method of anti-tank warfare. There was no shortage of dogs in Russia, and so the army tried to turn them into unique kamikaze weapons. They would hide food under German tanks, strap small explosives to the dog's back, and then send them to trigger their bombs under the tanks. Heck of a way to treat man's best friend. But it wasn't just animal lovers who found problems with the plan. Dogs are living beings, and that means they can be unpredictable. While the basics of the plan worked and even took out a few German tanks, it's impossible to ensure accuracy with animals. Some dogs simply ran off, and worse, some got spooked and ran back to their Russian handlers and detonated the explosives there. But the success rate was enough that the program continued through the war, with other countries training dogs too. Russia even had a program for training bomb-equipped dogs through 1996. It wasn't the only plan to use animals as bombs, but this next one had an unexpected ending. Number 5. Explosive Rats France had fallen, and Prime Minister Winston Churchill was desperate to prevent Great Britain from following suit. His weapons design team came up with a bizarre plan turning rats into plastic explosives. Rats would be killed and skinned with their empty carcass then being filled with plastic explosives and shaped to resemble an actual rat before being sewn back up. They would then be placed near German boilers where they would be thrown for disposal, triggering a massive explosion that could devastate German factories. It didn't quite work out like that. The first shipment of explosive rats were sent out and quickly discovered by the Nazis. The British dropped the plans and didn't make any more rats, but the Germans didn't know that. They were shocked by the carefully hidden explosives and ordered an extensive search for dead rats at every military school and facility. They spent so much time examining dead rats that the British military authorities said the plan actually succeeded because they caused more trouble to the Germans than if the rats had actually exploded. But that wasn't the most bizarre plan to use animals as weapons. Number 4. Bird and Bat Bombs 
It was only a short time after Pearl Harbor, and a Pennsylvania dentist named Lytle S. Adams was outraged. He wanted revenge, and he wrote to FDR with a plan, train bats as bombs. But instead of calling the authorities, military officials looked at the plan and thought there might be something to it. Hibernating bats would be attached to timed explosive devices and dropped over Japan at dawn. The bats would settle in the upper levels of buildings and the devices would go off while they slept, turning Japanese cities into firestorms. While demonstrations were carried out, the plan never went into effect, maybe because some bats got away and blew up a general's car. But it wasn't the only flying bomb plan the military had, and the next had a major mind behind it. B.F. Skinner was a pioneer in the field of psychology, but he was also passionate about training pigeons. He believed they could be a weapon of war, even more so as messengers. He had trained them to pull levers and believed this system could be rigged to deliver a kamikaze bomb to its target. The pigeons would be trained to recognize a target and would peck to guide the missile toward it. A successful demonstration was pulled off, but like the Bat Project, as the war went on, the military shifted their focus to more traditional weaponry, and both pigeons and bats breathed a little safer. But in 1944, terror came from the skies in a different way. Number 3. Fugo Balloon Bomb Aside from Pearl Harbor, very few attacks during World War II hit the United States directly. But in 1944, a bizarre Japanese attack changed that. It was one of the lowest tech attacks imaginable. Paper balloons that would be guided not by any engine but by the Pacific Ocean's jet stream. But the payload they held would be anything but low tech. They carried incendiary bombs, designed to kill anyone nearby and create dangerous wildfires. They were actually the first weapons ever to have an intercontinental range. And when they landed, chaos ensued. Initially, the bombs caused little damage, but as they surfaced around the west coast of the United States, people panicked. Reports of balloons landing around the country spread, and the government created a press blackout to avoid widespread fear. That ended on May 5, 1945, when a bomb landed in southern Oregon and blew up, killing a woman and five children from a nearby church. An investigation revealed that the bomb had been sitting there untouched for weeks until the picnicking group disturbed it and set off the lethal explosion, the only World War II death on mainland soil. But not all World War II weapons were meant to be deadly. Number 2. Who? Me? Private Ernest Crocker came into the military as a trained chemist, and that gave him a unique position, designing poison gas for possible military use. But the military had another mission in mind for him. Remember those exploding stink bombs you used to play with as a kid? What if they could be mega-sized and create a scent so horrible it would send the enemy forces fleeing? Well, some might say this plan stinks, but the US government didn't think so, and funded the project that would be nicknamed the US military's Fart Bomb. But to develop this weapon, Private Crocker had some unpleasant times ahead. He needed to create a bomb that would deliver the worst smells imaginable, and that meant testing. He combined smells including vomit, urine, rotten eggs, human feces, and rancid dairy into a single package. And the workers at Maryland Research Laboratory who had to mass produce it were no doubt smelling it for years. The German army was ultimately spared its effects because the war ended before the stinky spray could be deployed. But this valuable work led Private Crocker to become a pioneer in the field of sensory science. But one weapon delivered in every way, but the one that mattered most. Number 1. The Great Panjandrum the final years of World War II saw a lot of experimentation in the British ranks as they created increasingly outlandish designs for weapons, most of which never saw the light of day. But one, the Panjandrum, would go down in history as one of the most bizarre weapons ever created. To the untrained eye, it didn't look like much, a big pair of interconnected wheels. But it was actually a highly sophisticated weapon, a massive rocket-propelled rolling cart designed to deliver an explosive payload to the Nazis. But reality doesn't live up to the hype sometimes. The Panjandrum would have been the fastest weapon of its size ever created, designed to penetrate 10-foot walls by traveling at 60 miles per hour right through them. The British superweapon became famous before it hit the battlefield, with citizens attending tests to witness their newest war machine in action. But it never quite lived up to its potential. Sometimes its rockets went off unexpectedly, sometimes it went in the wrong direction, a problem when you're dealing with a massive destructive rolling tank. It was never used in combat, but it maintained a fan base among military buffs. On the 65th anniversary of Normandy, a replica was designed and tested, and that too failed miserably. Alas, Great Panjandrum, you were maybe too spectacular for the real world. It's the world's most technologically advanced military. It's also home to equipment almost 100 years old. These are some of the oldest weapons still in operation in the US military. M2 Browning 50 caliber machine gun. It's been the United States' premier heavy machine gun for a whopping 89 years, and it's not looking to retire anytime soon. Designed in 1918 and adopted by the US military in 1933, the M2 packs a formidable 50 caliber bullet 
fired at a muzzle velocity of 890 meters per second. It has a maximum range of 7,400 meters and an effective range of 1,800 meters. This machine gun is powerful enough to punch through even some armored vehicles, and that's exactly what it was originally meant to do. At the end of World War I, more heavily armored planes were being put into the air, with the German Junkers J.I. sporting an armor that made traditional aircraft machine guns largely ineffective. General John J. Pershing, commander of the American Expeditionary Force, requested the Army Ordnance Department develop a heavier machine gun capable of punching through improved aircraft armor. His request was for a machine gun capable of firing a minimum 50 caliber round at a minimum muzzle velocity of 820 meters per second. John M. Browning began redesigning his 30-06 M. 1917 machine gun to be capable of firing a heavier round requested by General Pershing. On October 15, 1918, Browning's first prototype was tested. Though it achieved a less than stellar performance with a firing rate of less than 500 rounds a minute and a muzzle velocity of only 700 meters per second. To make matters worse, the weapon was very heavy compared to lower caliber models, was difficult to control when firing fully automatic, and was too weak to punch through armor while firing too slowly to be effective against enemy infantry. Browning got unexpected aid when a shipment of German T. Gewehr 1918 anti-tank rifles and their ammunition were seized by American forces. The German rounds had an 800 grain bullet with a muzzle velocity of 820 meters a second and could penetrate one inch of armor at 230 meters. Using the German rounds as inspiration, Winchester worked on improving the 50 caliber cartridge, eventually leading to an effective round that achieved most of what the Army had requested of it. From 1921 to 1937, American aircraft were equipped with an experimental water-cooled version of the machine gun. These trials helped to refine the various versions of what would become the M2, formerly adopted by the United States before World War II. By the time the war broke out, the machine gun was standard on nearly every American aircraft and was used in everything from anti-material to infantry support and even air defense roles. Today, the 50 caliber enjoys service alongside American troops in every theater of operations and has been involved in every American conflict since World War II. Modern 50 calibers can be equipped with several different types of ammunition, including M33 ball rounds for personal and light material targets, M17 tracer, M8 armor penetrating incendiary, M20 armor penetrating incendiary tracers, and newer sabotaged light armor penetrator rounds capable of punching through 1.34 inches of steel armor at 500 meters. The M2, nicknamed the 50 or Mod Deuce, is such a good weapon it outperformed an intended replacement in the 60s, and a current modern replacement for the weapon was canceled. This means the US military will continue carrying the fearsome M2 into battle for decades more to come. Our next weapon system is not as old as the M2, but current plans are to keep it in operation for almost an entire century. CH-47 Chinook It was a helicopter born of necessity. Caught up in a war waged across inhospitable jungles with few roads, the US Army desperately needed a way to quickly supply firebases spread across Vietnam. Most importantly, though, it needed to be able to supply those far-flung firebases with heavy equipment such as artillery. But cutting a road through the thick jungle would take years, and even then, the unpredictable weather and enemy ambushes could make such a journey impossible. The United States invented air assault operations during Vietnam with its extensive fleet of helicopters and quickly stopped to do the same with logistical concerns. However, current helicopters in the US inventory were simply not powerful enough to carry heavy howitzers. Fortuitously, though, a twin-rotor transport helicopter had already been in development since 1957 to replace the Sikorsky CH-37 Mojave. The resulting V-107 was deemed too heavy for assault operations but too light for transport missions. Thus, work was undertaken to develop a larger, beefier helicopter capable of heavy transport duty. In 1962, the CH-47 Chinook officially joined the inventory of the US Army armed forces. Despite its massive size, the Chinook has an impressive speed of 200 miles per hour and at the time was faster than any other utility or even attack helicopter. Today, the Chinook keeps that speed record, making it one of the fastest helicopters in the US inventory. Throughout its lifetime, the airframe has received numerous upgrades to keep it up to date with new technology, but the core design remains largely unchanged. With two powerful rotors, the Chinook can carry up to 55 fully equipped combat troops or as much as 10 tons of cargo either inside or slung underneath it on cargo hooks. The helicopter would prove its worth through every US conflict since Vietnam, but really shown during the war in Afghanistan. With its difficult and mountainous terrain, Afghanistan proved to be a challenge for the US Army carrying out resupply and mobility operations, but the Chinook was easily able to navigate even the extreme heights of Afghanistan's mountains with ease. The Chinook continues going strong 60 years after being adopted 
mounted into the U.S. inventory. The Army's future vertical lift program will eventually deliver a replacement for the Chinook, but will focus first on a replacement for the UH-60 Blackhawk. In the meantime, future upgrades will keep the Chinook in operation for a predicted 99 years. Our next weapon is not just old, but proved to be so good at its job that its use was even expanded within the U.S. military. Carl Gustav Recoilless Rifle In service since 1946, the Carl Gustav 8.4cm recoilless rifle is perhaps the most successful anti-tank weapon ever made, and the U.S. military plans on continuing to use it for a long time. The Carl Gustav M1 was developed in 1946 by Hugo Abramson and Harold Jeans at the Royal Swedish Arms Administration. The weapon was developed with the help of knowledge gained from the operation of American bazookas, British Piats, and German Panzerschreck during the war, building on the strengths of each while making its own innovations. The greatest of these innovations was the use of a rifle barrel to spin-stabilize an explosive round, negating the need for a projectile to be outfitted with fins and thus reducing weight and improving performance. Another improvement over the Allied and German World War II two anti-tank weapons came in the form of developing the weapon as a recoilless system. A recoilless weapon ejects countermass from the rear of the weapon to negate the effect of recoil when firing. This allows the weapon to be much more accurate and to fire a larger projectile, while making the firing unit lighter and easier to use. Today, the Carl Gustav is an extremely economical solution for the anti-tank and anti-material needs of any infantry unit, with a unit cost of just $20,000 and an ammo cost that ranges from $500 to $3,000 depending on the round. The weapon can fire up to six rounds a minute with a crew of two, though it can be operated by just one soldier at a reduced rate of fire. It's also capable of accurately hitting moving vehicles at a range of up to 400 meters, stationary targets up to 500 meters, and can use high explosive rounds with a range of 1,000 meters, or rocket-boosted laser-guided ammunition at a range of up to a whopping 2,000 meters. The U.S. military initially only issued the weapon to Special Operations Forces, but it was so good at its job, it expanded the use of the Carl Gustav to regular forces as well, with U.S. forces being engaged by RP at ranges up to 900 meters, no light weapon in the inventory of U.S. infantry could effectively counter this threat. Thus, the M3 multi-role anti-armor anti-tank weapon system variant of the Carl Gustav quickly came into wide adoption. Along with wider adoption came an increased variety in ammunition, which quickly made the M3 a favorite of U.S. infantry. Today, the Carl Gustav can fire high-explosive rounds, high-explosive anti-tank rounds, high-explosive anti-tank rocket-assisted rounds for increased range, high-explosive dual-purpose rounds for engaging enemy vehicles vehicles and structures, area defense rounds for engaging large numbers of enemy troops, anti-structure rounds for destroying enemy buildings, smoke rounds for creating a thick smoke screen, and illumination rounds for lighting up large swaths of grounds at night. The Carl Gustav is so good at its job there is no planned replacement in the pipeline, and instead it continues to be upgraded with even more modern projectiles and electronics. Our next aircraft has been the workhorse of the American Air Force for 65 years, and looks to continue that role for another 30. The C-130 Hercules During the Cold War, the United States knew it could be forced to fight in the most destructive conflict mankind could ever wage. Given the unprecedented destruction of even a non-nuclear conflict between itself and the Soviet Union, the U.S. needed to ensure it could still resupply forces across a devastated Europe. To that end, it called upon the C-130 Hercules, possibly the world's most rugged and versatile cargo aircraft. Its primary selling point was its ability to operate out of makeshift airfields, a key concern for a U.S. military facing a very real probability of having Allied airfields knocked out of commission by Soviet forces. Its requirements, however, were set in the years after the Korean War, when the U.S. realized it needed it needed dedicated military cargo aircraft and not models adapted from civilian use. The C-130 would be specifically designed to be a modern military cargo plane with a capacity of 92 passengers or 72 combat troops. Alternatively, it could fit 64 paratroopers and all of the equipment they need instead. The use of four turboprop engines gave the aircraft greater range and gas mileage than a turbojet variant and explains why it remains in use throughout the modern age. With few core design changes, the C-130 remains in service with various configurations, including the vaunted AC-130 gunship, the modern C-130J Super Hercules, featuring improved avionics, new engines, new composite propellers, and other modern updates, ski-equipped variants for ice operations, and the tactical airlift and aerial refueling variant in use by the U.S. Marine Corps. Maritime patrol versions are in service with the U.S. Coast Guard, and a ruggedized version of the Hercules is used in the deployment and retrieval of special operations forces. The C-130 remains in service not just in the U.S. military, but in militaries around the world, and looks set to continue serving with its home nation until the U.S. Air Force completes its CX Next Generation Airlifter program. Our next entry in this list is not just one of the oldest serving weapons in the U.S. inventory, but is scheduled to have a lifetime in excess of 100 years. 
the B-52 Stratofortress Strategic Bomber. It can level a small town all on its own, and it can fly a whopping one-third of the way around the Earth without refueling to do so. It's the United States' big stick, the B-52 Stratofortress. Its origins herald back to 1945, just two months after the end of World War II. The United States was already looking ahead to the next conflict. The Air Material Command put out requests to aircraft manufacturers for what would become the heavy bomber of the future. This aircraft would need to carry out missions far from home and operate without the aid of advanced bases in other countries. In other words, this big bomber needed to have a great enough range that it could strike anywhere in the world without worrying about securing ground bases in other countries to do so. It was to have a crew of at least five turret gunners to defend the aircraft and a six-man relief crew for long-range and long-duration missions. The aircraft would need to cruise at a minimum of 300 miles per hour at a height of 40 3,000 feet and be capable of hitting targets 5,000 miles away. For defense, it would carry 20mm cannons, and on the offense, it would drop 10,000 pounds high explosives. For the next several years, Boeing and the U.S. military would go back and forth on design changes, finally landing on the B-52 we recognize today in 1952. The aircraft would go on to break many records, shockingly even speed records, setting a world speed record of 560.705 miles per hour in 1958, only to be broken that same day by another B-52 flying at 597.675 miles per hour. That speedy bomber would eventually be outrun by a smaller jet aircraft, but the big plane continued to set and break records in endurance with a whopping 12,532-mile unrefueled flight in 1962. With the support of aerial tankers, though, B-52s were able to circle the globe non-stop in just under two days. This incredible reach in endurance quickly earned the planes a nuclear mission, and to this day remains part of the U.S. nuclear triad. However, it's the conventional firepower that makes the B-52 the undisputed kings of the sky. With the ability to drop a whopping 70,000 pounds of explosives on any target around the world, modern upgrades to the fleet include new engines and wing structure replacements, electro-optical sensors, and infrared and advanced targeting pods. B-52s are now capable of such precise strikes that they were used commonly as close air support platforms for coalition forces in Iraq and Afghanistan, delivering overwhelming firepower with pinpoint accuracy. Originally meant to saturate a target with dumb gravity bombs, modern B-52s use a suite of onboard sensors sensors to monitor a battlefield and deliver precision fire exactly where it's needed most. Laser-guided bombs can be guided to a target by a B-52 or allied aircraft, or even by forces on the ground. GPS-guided munitions can be fired and forgotten by a loitering B-52, and the development of long-range standoff attack munitions can give the B-52 an incredible reach even in contested air environments by staying well out of the reach of enemy weapons and sensors. With even more upgrades to come, the American B-52 fleet is set to remain in operation for an estimated additional 50 years with some estimates placing the B-52 total lifetime at 150 years. That means that by the year 2100, B-52s could still be flying as part of America's arsenal. They were the two largest conflicts in human history, and the weapons used in both conflicts shaped warfare for generations to come. But how do the deadliest weapons of World War I and World War II compare? First, we're starting off with the First World War with an invention that was meant to protect cattle, but was almost immediately adopted for military use – barbed wire. The first patent for a form of barbed wire fencing was issued to Léonce Grassin Baladon in 1860s France, but it was an American and Illinois farmer Joseph F. Gilden who is credited with inventing barbed wire as we know it today. His invention was one of necessity. How do you keep 500-pound cows and bulls from roaming away and escaping or getting themselves into trouble? You could use traditional rock fencing or heavy post fencing, though both were very labor and time intensive to create, not to mention expensive for a poor farmer. Gildan's solution was brilliantly simple. He simply strung up two twisted strands of wire that had evenly spaced sharpened barbs in place. The twisted strands guaranteed that when an animal pushed against the fencing to try to escape, it would be met with many sharp barbs. The pain from the barbs would immediately deter even the angriest bull from trying to break through the fence. The fence could be mass-produced, thus lowering cost, and a small team could install hundreds of yards of fencing in a single day. It was a brilliant solution that almost immediately caught the attention of military commanders around the world. Barbed wire saw use in every major conflict in the turn of the 20th century, though it came to particularly devilish use during the First World War. While the machine gun was responsible for the trench warfare tactics we saw in the conflict and is seen as the most influential weapon of the war, few knew that without barbed wire the machine gun would have been far less effective than it ended up being and it was all in the way that it was deployed. As an offensive weapon, barbed wire is useless, but as a defensive weapon, barbed wire proved to be deadly for both sides of the conflict. A common tactic was to lay down belts of barbed wire in a zigzag pattern that was from 30 feet to 100 feet wide. 
sometimes even more. This meant that the enemy infantry had to cut through multiple tangles of the stuff just to make any progress, instead of just laying them down as independent strands, which could be cut much easier and faster. While that infantry was busy trying to cut through the barbed wire, the enemy could rain rifle and machine gun fire on them. Just a few strands of barbed wire could effectively bring an assault of thousands to a dead standstill, pun fully intended. However, barbed wire could also be used to funnel enemy soldiers into massive killing fields, and this is where it proved to be at its most deadly. Machine guns and artillery could all be zeroed in on a pre-planned killing field, making them deadly accurate against advancing enemy infantry. An account from the Battle of Soma highlights how deadly barbed wire had become. Those Newfoundlanders who did reach their own wire, four well-laid belts and all, had to follow zigzag lanes between pre-cut gaps which had been exactly pinpointed by German machine gunners. Those who managed to get through those gaps had to cross 500 yards of open ground exposed to German positions. Those Newfoundlanders who had reached the German wire were shot down as they tried to cut their way through it with their wire cutters. Both sides came up with attempts to defeat barbed wire, one of which was to use special mats that one could lay over the obstacle and provide safety for advancing soldiers. However, one misstep would see you tumble into a mass of the stuff, completely entangling you while you also lacerated and mauled your flesh. Hopelessly stuck, your only hope was that your side won the engagement and a rescue party could come later and cut you out. Or you could take your chances simply tearing free of the stuff, an extremely unenviable proposition. The Bangalore torpedo was also developed as a way of defeating barbed wire. It consisted of a series of five-foot lengths of pipe which could be screwed together and were filled with explosives. Then, the entire assembly was shoved through the wire and the fuse lit. The resulting explosion would clear a five-foot path through the stuff. However, this meant that you would be exposed to enemy fire the entire time you were busy assembling your torpedo and waiting for the fuse to go off. It was the development of one of the deadliest weapons of World War II that led to the end of barbed wire's reign as one of the most feared tools on the battlefield. While barbed wire would continue to be used throughout World War II to protect defensive positions, the tank with its thick armor and wide treads could easily smash through the stuff. Thus, the use of barbed wire dropped steeply after World War I, though it remains in use around the world for its excellent anti-personnel properties. It just isn't as effective as it once was thanks to the proliferation of armored vehicles. Our next deadliest weapon would have its infancy in World War I, but would be responsible for almost knocking an entire country out of the war before it even joined World War II. The Airplane Almost from the advent of powered flight, man saw its potential for war, but it would take a few years for its true potential to be discovered. Before the airplane, armies relied on mounted scouts or even hot air balloons to conduct reconnaissance, but the advent of a fast mobile platform that gave its pilot a bird's eye view of a battlefield proved to be an absolute game changer. Now it was possible to get detailed tactical information not just on an enemy's front lines, but deep behind them. Valuable information that could be passed along to the artillery corps and used to destroy enemy supply depots and command posts, not visible to scouts on the ground or operating from stationary balloons. It was at the First Battle of Marna when the airplane first proved itself an exceptionally valuable tool for any military and prompted the need to defend one's own skies against enemy airplanes. During this battle, Allied reconnaissance planes were able to spot a gap in the German lines that was not visible from the ground. The Allies soon massed an attack against this gap and succeeded in splitting the German line, forcing them to retreat or be overwhelmed. It was clear that the airplane was necessary for modern war and that it was just as necessary to keep the friendly skies clear of them. The first scout planes had no armaments and instead pilots would engage in shootouts with each other using revolvers. With a pressing need to destroy enemy scout aircraft though, engineers on both sides of the lines worked to develop armament that could be fitted on an airplane that had the ability to shoot enemy planes out of the sky. The first such weapons consisted of carefully timed machine guns that were directly linked to the plane's propeller and thus could shoot through the rapidly spinning blades without damaging them. These were known as synchronization gears. The first synchronization gear to enter service was fitted on a German Fokker Eindecker fighter and proved to be mostly reliable. Gradually, the technology improved to the point that fewer and fewer pilots were shooting their own propellers off. It wouldn't be until the 1930s that these types of machine guns would go out of style. Armed with machine guns, planes could now attack and destroy each other effectively, keeping nosy enemy scouts from getting a good fix on your troops down below. However, on top of this, from the onset of powered flight, it also became obvious that the airplane could be an excellent tool for dropping bombs on the enemy with far greater accuracy than artillery. However, this would remain a pipe dream for most of the war due to the technological limitations of early engines. In place of bombs, some planes carried great loads of sharpened wood darts that were light enough to allow a plane to carry hundreds of them at a time. However, the darts were completely unguided and their effectiveness was limited, though they did succeed at causing casualties on the ground and the French used them all the way to the end of the war. Early planes were able to carry some explosives but would need to drop them from low altitudes to have any hope of hitting their targets due to how light the explosives were. 
This in turn exposed the airplane to withering ground fire. With the development of more powerful engines, planes were able to carry larger loads at higher altitudes, and by the end of the war, the bomber aircraft began to come into its own. After World War I, though, few people saw the potential of the airplane. American General William Lendrum Mitchell, however, had seen how revolutionary air power would quickly become, but his efforts to convince a staunchly traditionalist military would end up costing him his career. Mitchell argued that the airplane would be the most important weapon of any future conflict. Despite the increasing lethality of airplanes in the First World War, many of Mitchell's contemporaries disagreed and believed that traditional artillery and battleships were more important than airplanes. Mitchell would go on to stage a series of demonstrations by sinking decommissioned battleships using bombs, but they proved unconvincing to Army leadership. For his incessant campaigning for an expanded air force, Mitchell would annoy his superiors to the point that they demoted him to colonel. When he accused the Army and Navy leadership of almost treasonable administration of the national defense after investing in battleships instead of aircraft carriers, Mitchell was court-martialed and he resigned shortly after. Mitchell would die in 1936, but the entire world would realize he had been correct all along after his death. When on December 7, 1941, out of the blue, a massive Japanese air attack nearly wiped out the U.S. Pacific Fleet. The U.S. was mostly left with its aircraft carriers in the Pacific for the early years of the war, which it employed to devastating effect against the Japanese. This sealed the fate of the battleship and proved that Mitchell had been correct all along. If U.S. military leadership had listened to him in 1925, the U.S. would have crushed Japan years earlier than it did with its massive fleet of aircraft carriers, instead of investing in slow, inaccurate battleships. In Europe, though, Germany also proved how deadly the airplane had become by brilliantly incorporating it into its blitzkrieg strategy. Air attacks would overwhelm enemy defenses with aerial bombardment, and the war even saw the airplane used as direct fire support for troops on the ground. Dive bombers were very effective for destroying enemy tanks with pinpoint accuracy, and few were as feared as the Junkers Ju-87 or Stuka. They even came equipped with an air siren, which would let out a horrifying wail as the plane dove on a target, further demoralizing the men on the ground. Fighters equipped with heavy machine guns and cannons could also strafe enemy positions and destroy armored vehicles with far greater accuracy than artillery fire or offshore fire support. By the end of the war, the airplane had become one of the most important advancements in the history of military technology. Our next most deadly weapon, though, continues to haunt the imaginations of people to this day and led to global action to ban its use in further conflicts. Poison gas Sometimes it was invisible and odorless, other times it came with a distinct sharp smell that preceded a sickly yellowish fog drifting over the landscape toward you. It was indiscriminate, and a change in the wind would end up killing friend and foe alike. Poison gas was without a doubt one of the worst weapons of World War I. France was the first to use gas, with canisters of tear gas lobbed at German positions in hopes of making their positions easier to assault. However, tear gas was at best an irritant that would cause uncontrolled tearing and difficulty breathing with symptoms clearing up within half an hour. This made the gas not particularly effective. Then Germany upped the ante significantly. Rather than use irritant gases, Germany decided that the most humane thing to do was to use deadly gases so as to secure a swift victory, preventing even greater casualties on both sides from prolonged fighting. Thus, in April 1915, Germany debuted the use of chlorine gas against the Allied lines. The gas is denser than air, meaning it would settle in low areas and move along the ground, perfect for infiltrating enemy trenches and killing soldiers within. At low doses, it causes coughing, vomiting, and extreme eye irritation. However, unprotected soldiers could inhale the gas, after which it would react with the water inside their lungs, creating hydrochloric acid. The acid would then just eat away at the lungs, causing suffocation or severe lung scarring for survivors. In just its first use, an estimated 1,100 soldiers were killed. But the gas was so surprisingly effective that the Germans weren't ready to exploit the situation. But chlorine gas had serious problems. For starters, its odor and color made it easy to spot, giving sharp-eyed soldiers a chance to quickly don protective gear. The gas was also water-soluble, so a simple wet rag over the mouth and nose was enough to protect a soldier. Next, the Germans unleashed phosgene gas, which was colorless and nearly undetectable at low concentrations, which was still enough to result in deadly effects. The gas reacted with the proteins in the alveoli of the lungs, disrupting the blood-air barrier and causing suffocation. Highly effective, the gas is thought to be responsible for up to 85% of the 91,000 gas deaths in the conflict, but the gas acted slowly and could take up to two days to cause a death through buildup of fluid in the lungs. For at least one of those days, soldiers could still put up some resistance, making it unsuitable for preparatory bombardments. 
The most common gas used in World War I was mustard gas, so called for its mustard color. While in pure form it's colorless, impure forms of the gas were widely used in World War I, giving it a distinct coloring and an odor similar to garlic or horseradish. The gas was not commonly deadly unless someone inhaled large quantities of it, but it was feared because even on contact with unprotected skin, it would cause large blisters which oozed yellowish fluids. These chemical burns made fighting difficult for those injured, and the blisters opened them up to more serious infections in the extremely unsanitary trenches of World War I. Often other gases would be used, such as chloropicrin, before a second round of gas attacks. These special gases were irritants, posing little threat to life but could bypass gas masks and would often make soldiers remove their gas masks as they suffered coughing or vomiting fits. Then the second deadlier gas could be introduced to unprotected soldiers leading to death. Ironically, gases were banned by the Hague Convention of 1899, though to obvious little effect. While gases proved to be less deadly than their ordinary rifles, accounting for between 1-2% to of casualties in World War I, they were extremely effective terror weapons that severely demoralized the enemy. After the war, they were banned again by the Geneva Protocol of 1925, with countries super pinky promising that this time they were serious and they wouldn't use them in war. In the Second World War, the Western powers did not use gas, though were prepared to do so. Japan feared a similar retaliation by Western armies, so used poison gases only against Chinese and other Asian forces who were viewed as inferior and lacked the technological sophistication to create weaponized gases themselves. Thus, the Japanese could launch gas attacks with little fear of their troops being gassed back. Knowing that the Japanese were using gas against other Asian countries, Australia imported poison gas from the UK and stored it in underground bunkers in case of invasion. If the Japanese unleashed poison gas against Australian forces, the Australians were ready to respond in kind. Despite not using it against Western armies, the Japanese did use Western POWs as guinea pigs in several experiments using poison gas. It's long been rumored that due to having been gassed in World War I, Hitler refused to use weapons in the Second World War, but that's not correct. The real reason that Germany did not use gas weapons was because its military lacked the technical capability to mass-produce poison gas for use on a battlefield. The Germans had approximately 45,000 tons of poison gas, but Hitler knew that the Allies had far more in reserve, and he feared an overwhelming retaliation. After their defeat at the Battle of Stalingrad, Hitler was urged to use poison gas in order to slow the advance of the Russians. Once more, Hitler feared an overwhelming retaliatory attack from the Allies. However, Hitler still ordered production of Tabun and sarin gases to be doubled. He ordered that chemical weapon stockpiles not be moved to the Russian front though, fearful that a rogue officer would use them and spark an allied retaliation. After the invasion of Italy, the Germans quickly either moved or destroyed their own and Italy's chemical weapon stockpiles for fear that again a rogue commander would order them used on allied soldiers. Gas could have prevented the Normandy invasion though and turned it into a strategic disaster. When asked why gas wasn't used, Hermann Göring later stated that as the Wehrmacht relied on horse-drawn transportation for resupply of their combat units and they had never been able to design a gas mask that a horse would tolerate and allowed sufficient air to pass for a horse to pull a cart, deploying a gas would harm the war effort more than it aided it. The Germans did use chemical weapons and extermination efforts though, using toxic smoke to force Russian resistance fighters out of their positions in the caverns beneath the city of Sevastopol. They also used asphyxiating gas in the catacombs of Odessa in November 1941 and in late May 1942 during the Battle of the Kirk Peninsula in eastern Crimea. After the battle, around 3,000 Red Army soldiers and civilians were besieged in a series of caves and tunnels in the Adzumushkai Quarry, and after three months of resistance, the Nazis finally released poison gases into the tunnels, killing most of them. Infamously, the Nazis used poison gas during the war, but not against fighting troops, but to murder millions of what they called undesirables. Though the Allies did not use chemical weapons, they were fully prepared to do so. The British created large stockpiles and moved them close to the southern coast in anticipation of German invasion. In case of said invasion, the British were fully prepared to use gas against the amphibious assaults. The Allies also prepared massive quantities of gas to be loaded onto planes to use against German cities if the Germans used their own poison gas, especially during the D-Day landings. Such an attack would have prompted a massive poison gas bombing campaign against German civilians, killing tens of thousands. Churchill was a strong proponent of using poison gas and was restrained only by his military leadership. He wrote a secret memorandum to his military chiefs urging them to strongly consider the use of poison gas against even civilian targets so as to shorten the war, writing, it is absurd to consider morality on this topic when everybody used it in the last war without a word of complaint. 
The US, meanwhile, developed deadly blood agents for use with their new bazooka launchers. These agents could penetrate the protective barriers of some gas masks and were seen as especially effective against Japanese troops holding out inside caves and bunkers. However, despite developing large stockpiles of the deadly gas, the US never used it. Our next deadly weapon also had its start in World War I, but while the rest of the world struggled to employ it, Nazi Germany made deadly use of it. Tanks September 1916 was the dawn of tank warfare. On a brisk fall morning, a small group of massive armored behemoths chugged along at 4 miles an hour, picking their way toward the front. Then, to the shock of German onlookers, the massive metal monsters began the long, slow journey across no man's land toward the trenches. Rifle and even machine gun fire proved completely ineffective. Nothing seemed it could stop the massive death machines. As combustion engines became more powerful, they could be used to propel even heavier machines. This led to a rise in armored cars, but cars were useless in trench warfare of World War I as they could only operate on roads. The British began to rethink the entire concept of an armored car and devise a machine that could help them break the deadlock of trench warfare. The result would be called the Tank a code name given to hide the true nature of the top-secret British project. Any wayward spy hearing the name would simply think the British were developing new water tanks to rehydrate their troops. In actuality, the British had designed massive monsters of iron and steel. The lumbering beasts had tracks that encircled the entire body and allowed them to simply drive straight over trenches, and instead of turret-mounted weapons like we see today, it had side-mounted cannons and machine guns to fire down into trenches from above. The thick armor made the vehicle immune to small arms fire of any kind, though the extremely slow speed of early tanks made them vulnerable to artillery fire. Inside of the cramped quarters was a crew of eight, a tank commander, driver, four gunners, and two men who helped shift gears. At the very height of the machine was a massive engine, which was not properly ventilated, running the risk of suffocating the crew. To make matters even worse, the engine would drive up the temperature inside the tank to unbearable degrees. With no suspension, the big lumbering beast would make for a horribly bumpy ride and be complete hell to operate. Despite this, tanks were quickly employed and made their first appearance on September 15, 1916. The British Army massed 49 tanks for an assault on the German trenches outside the village French of Flair. However, many of the tanks never even made it to their starting positions, breaking down en route. Even after the battle commenced, many of the tanks would break down or just plain get stuck on the many craters of no man's land. Only nine tanks managed to achieve their goals inside enemy lines, but the British were satisfied enough with the results to go all in on tanks. Early tanks experienced frequent breakdowns and the interior conditions were almost as dangerous for the crew as the battlefield outside. As the war progressed, Germany developed armor-piercing ammunition that could pierce the 8mm thick side armor, so the British doubled down and made the armor even thicker. This prompted the development of the first anti-tank rifle, the German TAC 1918. A more practical solution was simply to bundle a few grenades together and hurl them directly at the tank. If exploding close enough to it, the explosion could kill the crew inside through spalding of the metal armor. By the Second World War, though, tanks were an indispensable tool of any modern military, and fierce competition between both sides led to the development of better armed and armored tanks. It was the Germans who employed them the most effectively at the start of the war. Despite their appearance in the First World War, the rest of the world still largely failed to appreciate the true potential of the tank. Thus, it was doctrine in most armies to spread tanks out and use them as infantry support platforms. The Germans instead concentrated their tanks into individual units and used them as a spearhead to break enemy defenses, allowing supporting infantry to exploit the gap created by the armored assault. The tactic was the cornerstone of the German Blitzkrieg and was soon copied by Western powers. The Second World War would see some of the greatest tank battles in history, many of them on the Eastern Front. Even in the Pacific, tanks were employed by both the Japanese and the Americans, though American tanks would prove to be far superior to their Japanese counterparts. By the end of the Second World War, it was official. No army could hope for victory without the copious use of main battle tanks. The villain stares up at the plans for the powerful weapon. This is no ordinary gun or rocket. When complete, it'll harness the power of the sun itself and rain fire and death down on his enemies. A mad scientist looking for revenge on a superhero? No, the villain was Nazi leader Adolf Hitler, and this weapon and many others were really built or planned by his scientists. What was the Wunderwaffe? The secret German program of wonder weapons? It was 1942 and the Nazi war machine was flagging. The United States had entered the war, the United Kingdom was stubbornly refusing to fall, and Hitler had the brilliant idea of invading Russia, which meant the German army now had to fight a war on two fronts. The morale of the military was fading. 
Hitler was devoting more and more resources toward targeting German citizens, and even many of his own generals were starting to whisper. Was the Fuhrer losing his marbles? Did Germany need a change in leadership? Naturally, that meant there was only one thing to do – turn up the propaganda. Led by Joseph Goebbels, the propaganda ministry started putting out news that would help turn the tide of the war. Because Germany's scientists were on the case and they were designing a whole new crop of Wunderwaffe, or wonder weapons, that the world had never seen before. These weapons, straight out of science fiction in some cases, were said to pack a power the world has never seen. Three years before the first atomic bombs were perfected, these secret weapons were said to turn the tide of any war and send the enemy running. So, was there any truth to these announcements? As usual, the answer is yes and no. The Germans did in fact have a top secret weapons program and it was led by some of the world's best scientists. Men like Werner von Braun, the aerospace engineer who was later taken out of Germany by the United States and became one of the heads of the space program, regularly presented Hitler with blueprints for wildly ambitious weapons. The only thing standing between Germany and unleashing these beasts on the battlefield was a lack of time and money, and Hitler was more than willing to give both of these to the Wunderwaffe program. And the results were impressive, at least on paper. The Wunderwaffe program went for quantity over quality in many cases, and they delivered designs and prototypes for countless new weapons. Some delivered the foundation of future weapons and innovations that swept the world. Others were created but didn't live up to the initial hype. Still others were designed on paper but the German army ran out of time before they became a reality, and yet others turned into complete and total disasters that we still marvel at today. Let's crack open the secret files of the Wunderwaffe and see which of these innovations succeeded and which terrified even Hitler. Germany had an impressive navy, but they were far behind the Allied powers in one area, aircraft carriers. Hitler wanted to expand Germany's naval power far beyond Europe, and to do that, they needed much more capacity. So they commissioned the Graf Zeppelin, a massive carrier that could have carried over 40 fighter planes and dive bombers. And it was one of the earliest Wunderwaffe projects, beginning construction in 1936, and it was still under construction in 1945. With Germany's defeat imminent, the ship was deliberately sunk to avoid it falling into enemy hands. It was later salvaged and used for weapons tests by the Soviets, a far cry from the powerhouse it was intended to be. But it wasn't the most impressive aircraft carrier in the Nazis' plans. The German ocean liner Europa was an impressive ship, one of the largest of the era. After losing a key battleship in 1941, the German Navy needed an aircraft carrier they could use quickly. So they came up with the idea, why not turn the cruise ship into a carrier? The largest of the vessels was chosen for conversion, the Europa was redesigned to the German aircraft carrier 1, and big plans were developed to convert it. And that's all they became, plans. Soon after the process began, it became clear there were serious structural weaknesses and the ship wasn't meant to carry airplanes. It wound up carrying troops after it was seized by the United States. If there was one thing the Wunderwaffe program loved, it was large ships. It was called Plan Z, the plan to expand and enhance the German Navy starting in 1939. The plans were always ambitious but never quite panned out, and that included the H-Class battleships. Never heard of the H-Class battleships? That's because they were designed to be by far the largest the German Navy had ever seen, with six ships loaded with massive guns and re reinforced deck armor. Ironically, what spelled their end was the very thing they were designed for, World War II. The Navy's focus went to retrofitting existing ships and the H-Class battleships faded off into the seas of fantasy. But one section of the German Navy got much more attention. The U-boat was the terror of the seas, as the German submarines sank countless Allied ships. But Hitler wanted them to be faster, stronger, and deadlier. Countless new models were proposed starting with the rocket U-boat. Most U-boats used standard torpedoes, but these blueprints intended to replace that with higher-powered rockets and missiles. This would allow the Germans to not only sink enemy ships more effectively, but potentially launch attacks on Britain and even the United States from the sea. The first tests were promising, but the lack of a guidance system made them ineffective. Ultimately, the rocket U-boat wasn't ready for combat by the time the war ended, but the scientists continued to refine them for other countries. There was a constant quest to upgrade the U-boat, and some got closer than others. The biggest challenge of using submarines in combat was that they weren't meant to stay underwater at length. They had to coast along the surface and could only submerge for short periods at a time. The Type 21 submarines aimed to change that, being the first ships to operate primarily underwater and only need to resurface for charging. The prototypes worked and they were put into production in a hurry. Over a hundred were completed and two were put into service, but at that point the sea war of the European front was all but over. Neither ship saw combat, 
but the design was impressive enough that both the US and USSR built on it in the future. But the designs that were meant for the surface were no less ambitious or strange. The Kugelblitz might sound like a falling rain of noodle puddings, but the World War II reality was much different. A planned anti-aircraft weapon, it was a self-propelled gun that would be attached to tanks and had the ability to shoot down enemy planes from the ground. It was the first model to have an enclosed rotating turret that would give it far greater maneuverability. The plans were approved to move it to the prototype phase, but that's where the project concluded as the war ended and only a few test vehicles had been completed. The only surviving turret stands on display at a German army museum. But to take down tanks, the German army would need some bigger guns. Literally, a rare example of a Wunderwaffe weapon that actually saw combat, the Sturer Emil anti-tank gun was an impressive beast. A lengthy run mounted on the hull of an armored tank, it could carry 15 rounds and move enough to aim effectively. The tank design was adjusted from standard heavy tanks to balance the huge barrel, and two models were completed and sent into the field. Named after Max and Moritz, a pair of German storybook characters, they both fell in combat, with Max being destroyed and Moritz being captured by the Soviets and placed on display in the Kubinka Tank Museum. And to carry a heavy gun, you need a heavy tank. The German heavy tank programs cranked out powerful weapons, but they wanted to go bigger. The largest tank at the time, the Panzer VII Maus, was under 200 tons. However, the planned land cruiser Rata was going to weigh a whopping 1,000 tons. Its armor would be almost 10 inches thick and covered with anti-aircraft guns along with a gun turret harvested from a battleship. Hitler was impressed with the wild ambition of the project and greenlit it, always being a fan of showy weapons. However, Minister of Armaments Albert Albert Speer saw it for what it was, a massive money pit, and cancelled the project in 1943 before it was built. Other tanks were less ambitious, but no more effective. Although the Land Cruiser Rata was never completed, its smaller cousin, the famous Panzer VIII Maus, was. The behemoth of a tank still holds the record for the heaviest fully enclosed armored vehicle ever created. Over 30 feet long and almost 12 feet high, weighing in at just under 200 metric tons, it's armed with a powerful anti-tank gun. The problem was, at that size and weight, it took a lot of power to run. It could reach a top speed of up to 14 miles per hour, but it was too heavy to even cross most bridges. The tank had to ford the river using a snorkel. It was designed for power and spectacle, not maneuverability, which no doubt led to its eventual capture by the Soviet forces. But it wasn't the most bizarre tank in the Nazis' plans. You've probably seen a tumbleweed rolling down the plains. What if that tumbleweed was made of metal instead? The Nazis designed a bizarre rolling tank known as the Kugelpanzer as part of the Wunderwaffe program, but the incomplete model recovered from the field left more questions than it answered. It didn't have any weapons attached and it seemed to be more of a mobile bunker than a tank. While it didn't seem to have much combat use, it certainly became a star exhibit in the Kubinka Tank Museum. And their plans for the air were no less ambitious. Military gliders were one of the most important parts of warfare, getting troops and supplies to where they were needed most. The Junkers Ju-332 Mammut was the largest glider the Germans tried to build. There was a hitch to the plan. It was supposed to be built out of non-strategic material to aid the war effort, so the German Luftwaffe tried to build the entire thing out of wood. It was planned to carry up to 4,400 pounds of cargo. Early tests showed the vehicle was incredibly unstable. It landed well before its planned destination and had to be towed back, its eventual fate being cut up for fuel. One area of the German weapons program got more attention than any other. It was a constant frustration for Hitler. For all the German army's strength, he was sorely lacking in air power. Germany hadn't been involved in long-range wars before the last few decades, and their air force was dwarfed by those of the United States and Japan. They were engaged in aerial combat against Great Britain, but their planes weren't capable of striking further off targets or getting involved in the Pacific Theater. The Wunderwaffe program was designed to change that, and their program had an in-your-face name, America Bomber doesn't leave much doubt what this thing was intended to do, does it? Germany wanted a long-range bomber that would be capable of delivering a Pearl Harbor-like attack against the East Coast American cities, especially New York, which Hitler fantasized about destroying. The German Air Ministry gathered several of the country's best aircraft designers to submit their own candidates for the plane that could deliver a shocking punch to the US on their home front. The results were mixed. Ultimately, two designs stood out from the crowd and were destined for production. The first, the Messerschmitt Me-264, was a long-range strategic bomber for the Luftwaffe. It was an all 
small metal heavy bomber similar in design to the B-52 and had relatively little in the way of armor and guns so it could carry more bombs. Three prototypes were built and overall impressed the brass, but Messerschmitt was already under a lot of demand for their fighter planes and so the project was abandoned and the competitor was chosen. And that competitor packed its own impressive payload. Junkers might have had a flop with its massive wooden glider, but their other models were anything but. The Junkers Ju-390 was the model ultimately chosen for the America Bomber project for one main reason. It could be adapted from some of their existing planes. Extra inner wing segments were added to the classic Junkers Ju-90 and 290 models and they quickly went into testing. But how successful they were is a subject of ongoing debate. Some say the test plane made secret flights to South Africa, Japan, and even New York, but there is no concrete proof of this. What's clear is that work on them continued into 1944 until their contracts were cancelled and the planes were eventually stripped for parts and destroyed. But the Nazis might have been more interested in one specific device. The future of Warcraft was rockets. Powerful devices that could provide fast launches from the ground and deliver massive payloads, or even take a man to the moon one day. Werner von Braun was known as the master of rockets, and many of his innovations were rocket-powered. Hundreds of designs were built for jet fighters, rocket-powered planes, bombers, ramming interceptors, and tactical bombers. But the jet fuel needed to power rockets was expensive, and the technology was new, and most of the Nazi rocket projects wound up as little more than expensive proof-of-concept displays for von Braun's future career. Although Hitler liked rockets, one thing's for sure, he liked heavy artillery more, and the Wunderwaffe program was happy to deliver. Why launch a hundred mortars when you can launch one with ten times the power? That was what Karl Gerat tried to answer. The massive siege mortar fired the largest self-propelled ammunition ever deployed, and six of the massive guns were built. The destination? The Eastern Front, where Russia had a massive terrain and manpower advantage over the invading Germans. The gun was even powerful enough to destroy bridges when deployed, but they were slow-moving and expensive to build. They delivered a powerful punch, but ultimately all but one were destroyed and the remainder found its final destination at, you guessed it, the Kobinka Tank Museum. But bigger isn't always better. The Schwerer Gustav was one of the most impressive guns ever built, weighing in almost 1,500 short tons and able to fire shells close to 30 miles. It was less a gun than a massive tank-like railway weapon that turned out to be the largest gun ever fired in combat. The problem is, massive guns don't just wind up where you'd like them to be without help. Getting the Schwerer Gustav to where it was supposed to be took a lot of time and manpower, which gave the enemy a lot of time to surround the German position and attack. It was a powerful weapon but not a practical one and was eventually destroyed to keep it from falling into enemy hands. But there was one gun that would have been even more powerful. Many of the Wunderwaffe projects never left the drawing board due to a lack of money or time. And that was the case for the Land Cruiser P-1500 Monster, a super heavy self-propelled gun that would have roamed the battlefield on a pair of treads. Weighing around 1500 tons, it would allow a massive gun like the Gustav to travel without being assembled by a team of soldiers. The problem was, well, Nazis tank development wasn't exactly going well. Vehicles like the Maus turned out to be a disaster, so rolling a giant gun around on two of those wasn't likely to go smoothly. It would also be an inviting target for air attacks. The monster was cancelled before it even got off the ground, and little documentation of it exists. Some Wunderwaffe projects were a little more practical. It was the early days of air warfare, and planes were expensive to make, so why not make them harder to shoot down? That was the goal of the Jagdfaust, an experimental anti-bomber rifle that would be equipped for German rocket planes. The Comet, the Luftwaffe's fastest plane, moved so fast that it made typical cannon rounds much harder, making accuracy a real problem for its pilots. The Jagdwaust eliminated that problem by eliminating the recoil and allowing it to be fired much faster. And unlike many German engineering projects, it worked. The gun got its first kill in April 1945. Too little, too late, as the war came to an end. The only thing more valuable than a new weapon was preserving existing ones. Losing expensive hardware was a common problem, especially when it was tanks, which the Nazis were constantly trying to upgrade. The massive weapons were especially vulnerable at night when they could be ambushed from the dark, which was why the German optics company Carl Zeiss AG developed a surprising project for the military in 1941. The FG-1250 was one of the first night vision devices ever built, working through infrared and designed to be mounted on tanks. It was one of the more effective devices, maybe proving that larger isn't always better. For many weapons, the key wasn't going bigger but smarter. It was the precursor in many ways to modern drone warfare, a weapon that wouldn't need to be aimed to 
directly at the target but could be guided to it. The Fritz X was a powerful bomb designed to take out heavily armed targets, but what made it unique was that it was the first precision guided weapon ever used in combat. The bomb would be guided by a radio controlled link that affected movable parts in the tail fins and was intended to sink ships. It successfully achieved that goal in 1943, but it wouldn't be long before the Allies developed countermeasures that could interfere with the delicate radio link. Some Wunderwaffe projects, though, were distinctly closer to science fiction. It was 1929 when German physicist Hermann Oberth came up with a mad proposal, a massive space station that would use a concave mirror to concentrate sunlight and refract it back at a specific point of the Earth with devastating results. Germany was not at war at this point, so maybe he just wanted to be a supervillain. But during the Second World War, German scientists began to build on the concept. They wanted to design a massive sun gun that would generate an immense amount of energy, enough to destroy a city with a single blast. The only problem was Germany didn't have a space program. No one did. When asked how long it would take to build their sun gun, they estimated between 50 and 100 years, which, when you consider Hitler's plans for a thousand-year Reich, might have been reasonable. But how bizarre were the projects of the Wunderwaffe truly? What was Die Glocke? The mysterious bell-shaped superweapon was one of the most mysterious supposed projects of the Wunderwaffe. It was exposed by Polish journalist Igor Witkowski in the year 2000, as he claimed he had uncovered a secret device that never saw the light of day. Some claimed the glowing contraption was an anti-gravity device, with some even saying it could be related to time travel. But in reality, all evidence is that Die Glocke was nothing. There's no evidence that Witkowski was exposing a true project instead of creating a clever tale. Other devices never got close to reality. The Wunderwaffe teams repeatedly came back to the idea of a directed energy weapon. Who wouldn't like a gun that never ran out of ammo, just needing to be recharged? That technology for Star Trek phasers wasn't there yet, but that didn't stop them from trying. The first attempt was a sonic cannon that could kill via high-intensity vibrations. It worked, but was too expensive and vulnerable to enemy fire to become a mainstay of combat. Undeterred, Hitler's mad scientists explored X-ray beams that could take down aircraft, but the electron accelerator they built as a test was eventually captured by the Americans. But one question has puzzled people for decades. How close did the Wunderwaffe get to the ultimate weapon? Nuclear fission was discovered in 1938, and only four months later Hitler already had scientists working on a short-lived nuclear bomb project. While it was shut down shortly before the Nazi invasion of Poland, a new project would soon begin as the Nazis started producing nuclear reactors, uranium, and heavy water in earnest. The project continued to be funded until the very end of the war, but contrary to popular belief, it was not a tight race for which side got to the finish line first. While the Manhattan Project was full steam ahead, the German nuclear bomb project was understaffed, and many of the scientists left to pursue more short-term war projects. It didn't help that many of Germany's top scientists had fled the Nazi regime. In the end, the Nazi nuclear bomb project met the fate of many other superweapons being harvested for parts by the Allies as they took over after the war. So what went wrong with the Wunderwaffe? Why did a project that created so many fantastical weapons ultimately deliver so many duds and completely fail to help the country win the war? For one thing, the scientists involved had to split their focus between so many projects that few got the opportunity to develop and be refined. Many were scrapped after one failed test. Torn between Hitler's mad ambition and Albert Speer's penny-pinching, the scientists were often between a rock and a hard place. While many did change the future of warfare, few were around long enough to deliver in combat, and those that were were often rolled out right before the close of the war. But one place is no doubt thankful for the Wunderwaffe, the Kubinka Tank Museum, which thanks them for many of their top exhibits. Ancient warfare, generally an old school affair where armies face off on the battlefield with weapons and armor, and occasionally something much larger, sometimes seaborne, and sometimes alive. Here are 10 of the most insane ancient super weapons you might never have heard of. Number 10. The Juga Crossbow in ancient times, projectiles were still an important part of warfare, but those using them were usually limited to simple weapons like slings and crossbows. While they could deliver a fatal blow, they weren't exactly efficient. The user had to wind up the weapon or align the crossbow, aim carefully, let loose, and then reload. If they were up against a single enemy or a key target, it could be effective. If they were up against an army, the weapon holder would likely be overrun sooner than later. And that was high on the minds of military strategists during the Warring States era of Chinese history more than 2,000 years ago, so they created what might be the first semi-automatic weapon in history, the repeating crossbow, which could fire several shots in quick succession. Did it pack the power of its traditional counterparts? Not quite. While traditional crossbows rely heavily on tension to draw the arrow back and propel it forward, 
These weapons pack much less force. Their strength is that the action of spanning the bow, placing the bolt, and shooting is combined into one movement, making it easier to fire in quick succession. All that's needed is to move the sliding lever back and forth while holding the pistol grip. It fires from the hip as the lever is pumped forward and back. Its main strength was speed, but the early examples found in Chinese archaeological digs were lacking in precision or strength. They were likely only able to deliver puncture wounds rather than fatal arrow blows. This led many to believe it was more of a minor defense weapon than a true tool of war, but these weapons might have had a sinister secret. The key to this weapon was found in the Kuchin Tushu Ji Cheng, an encyclopedia of Chinese history written during the 1700s. It was described as a handy little weapon often used by elderly scholars or women who worked in the palace as a defensive weapon, but they weren't just shooting tacks. The arrows they shot were tipped with poison, called tiger-killing poison, which was said to kill a person or even a horse if it successfully drew blood. While the weapon evolved since and was revised several times through Chinese history, the core model remained largely the same, meaning this fast-firing weapon has lasted several thousand years, mostly unchanged. It was such an effective tool it was last used in warfare around the 19th century. This next weapon also made its debut in China, but it packs a bigger punch. Number 9. The Trebuchet the catapult is the ultimate weapon for delivering a large projectile, right? You load it up, you cut the rope, and it's flung hard enough to break down a rock wall. But that's nothing compared to the trebuchet, which was the most powerful projectile weapon before the invention of gunpowder. Designed to use a counterweight and a long arm, it can fire heavier projectiles much further than a traditional catapult. It all started with the traction trebuchet in ancient China around 2,500 years ago. 17 feet high with a throwing arm of at least 30 feet, it relied on manpower, lots of manpower. A large group of men would pull ropes attached to the end of the trebuchet beam, and when released this created a massive rotational force that would propel the projectile further than would be possible with any other machine. But soon a much better model would emerge. The biggest negative of the original traction trebuchet was how much manpower it took to fire each shot and how long it took to set it up. The model was used for over a thousand years, with the counterweight trebuchet only being created around the 12th century in the Mediterranean and later being adopted by China after they encountered it in battle with the Mongols. The counterweight trebuchet uses a powerful weight, a heavy box usually filled with rocks or sand. When attached to the shorter end of the beam and released on command, it does the work of several men and pulls the beam that creates the force needed to propel the projectile. This trebuchet is usually larger, stronger, and requires a lot more manpower to build and set up, but once it's ready, there were few weapons in ancient warfare who could match its power. And there's a reason it stood the test of time. The trebuchet is useful because its basket can carry just about anything. Sure, the most popular ammo was rocks or other hard objects that could be used to knock down enemy defenses, but as weapons evolved, incendiary weapons that could set a city afire could also be loaded into the basket and fired. For those willing to fight dirty, they could even load up human waste or corpses of soldiers felled in battle and seek to contaminate the enemy city with a deadly disease. While the weapon declined in use once gunpowder was invented, who needs a giant machine to fling things when you can just light a fuse, right? It's one of the only weapons on this list that's still recreated frequently today. Recreations have been built around the world, and even in today's world of modern weapons, it packs a punch. But sometimes you need to have something a little more lively. Number 8. War Elephants for steeds in combat, you can't do much better than the horse. They can carry a lot, they can move fast, and they're easy to train. But they're not going to be knocking down any walls, and sometimes you need a bit more muscle. Enter the largest land mammal alive, the elephant. Massive, incredibly strong, and with a bonus limb and tough tusks, it's not hard to see how they'd make an amazing weapon. There's just one problem. They're strong enough to kill a human in seconds if they get mad, and before you can ride them into battle, you have to train them. That's why it took a special talent to train them. The elephant trainer, or the mahout, would slowly get the elephant used to being led by using chains and hooks, then guide them in how to avoid obstacles and follow formation patterns. And once they were trained, they were nearly unstoppable. Although the first elephants were trained for agricultural work in Asia, it's believed that elephant warfare started in ancient India. They show up repeatedly in ancient Indian epics like Ramayana, where kings are frequently depicted riding them into battle. After all, what more impressive way to indicate who's in charge than having them atop the king of beasts? But soon they were used in much larger numbers, being used to provide high ground for archers or to carry heavy equipment. Elephants are so strong it was common for small towers to be built on their backs for multiple soldiers to shoot from. And for those well-trained elephants who could be led into combat, some armies even attach specialized blades to the tusks to give them an even nastier edge in combat. But working with the giant beasts had its downside. Elephants were the first tanks, but most tanks don't get spooked easily. One elephant getting startled could easily cause a stampede, leading to a derailed charge or a trampled army. 
but they were effective for long-distance military marches, most famously Hannibal's crossing of the Alps in his war against the Roman Empire. Between the difficulty of training elephants and the increased rarity of the animals, many of whom are now hunted for their tusks and highly endangered, military elephants became increasingly rare as modern technology advanced. By the 20th century, they were a rarity, but they hadn't been retired completely. In the Second World War, elephants were used to tow airplanes and do other heavy-duty tasks in Asia, and they saw limited use as late as the Vietnam War. This next fiery weapon was way ahead of its time. Number 7. Greek Fire You're aboard a ship carrying soldiers and you're about to run into your dreaded enemy, the ships of the Eastern Roman Empire. They've got superior forces, but your men are well trained and you're ready to take on their conventional weapons. But this time they're not packing conventional weapons, they're packing Greek fire, and suddenly they pull out a cannon that fires what looks like a massive plume of flame at you, igniting the ship and sending you and your men leaping off the boat before it sinks to the bottom of the sea. Was this a strange case of time travel where someone from the future made sure they had a flamethrower to keep them from losing a key battle? Nope, it's just good old fashioned chemistry. What actually is Greek fire? That's one of the biggest mysteries of the warfare around 672 CE. It was primarily used by the Byzantine Empire against Arab enemies, and it had two key parts. An incendiary compound, usually a powder, would be ignited, but it wouldn't be allowed to burn out of control. Instead, it would be fed through a nozzle and pointed outward at the enemy ship, creating a concentrated burst of flame that would spew straight forward. With the necessary closeness and good aim, it could catch an enemy ship on fire and wipe out an entire army, or at least ignite its sails and leave them stranded. Of course, the bigger challenge was making sure it didn't catch your own ship on fire in the process. But there's one mystery remaining. Exactly what were the ingredients of this weapon? Greek fire was written about extensively in the books of the era, but they left one major detail out the chemical compounds. This controlled fire not only worked as a flamethrower, but there were rumors it could stay afire even on water, making it impossible to steer away easily. This led to modern speculation that it could have been made of components including naphtha, quicklime, and pine resin. While it was typically deployed through large carried projectors, there were also drawings with small handheld projectors. What could go wrong with giving each soldier on a boat their own personal flamethrower? It was also placed into flasks and thrown, just like an ancient grenade. While it's faded into antiquity now, Greek fire was no doubt an early forerunner of today's incendiary weapons. But one country did them one better in explosive weapons. Number 6. Holong Chushwe Ah, fireworks. There's nothing like watching them blow up in midair. Sometimes, if you're lucky, you'll get to watch a multi-stage one go off as it dazzles with one release of color after another. It's all fun and games until that rocket's coming straight for you. When packed with more gunpowder, a firework becomes a powerful weapon, as well as going down in history as the first form of ballistic missile. And they started in the world capital of ahead of their time weapons, China. It was the 14th century when the Huolong Chu Shui was first recorded, and it's well known that they had fireworks and gunpowder by then. What wasn't expected was sophisticated rockets that could deliver more than one stage. And they didn't just deliver a blow, they delivered some great aesthetics too. The Huolong Chushui looked a lot like modern rockets, about 5 feet long. It was made of a bamboo too, but they wanted to send a message, so the rocket was given an ornately carved dragon head and tail. Pour one out for the poor artist who had to design those features only to have them blow up after one use. And inside the body would be four rockets filled with gunpowder that could give the tube a powerful launch. Four fuses would be lit, and as they ignited, the rocket would launch far faster than any other rocket of the era. After all, four rockets are better than one, and anyone seeing the rocket coming would run for cover. But you can run, but you can't hide. Because the Huolong Shushui had a big secret, inside the mouth were three smaller arrow rockets, and just as the fuses of the first rockets were about to burn out, they would light the smaller rockets, which would burst out of the main rocket and hit four different locations instead of just one. It was the most advanced rocket of its era, and the idea of a multi-stage rocket caught on. It's still used in warfare today, with such controversial munitions like cluster bombs dropping mini-bombs when they explode. While this rocket has faded into obscurity, it made an appearance in the Disney version of Mulan, and we're betting that if it was sold on the fireworks black market, it would be making a return to your neighborhood. Now let's get into a weapon that could serve more than one purpose. Number 5. Scythed Chariot the chariot was a game changer in combat. Unlike traditional horseback troops, you weren't fully at the mercy of a temperamental animal. You could carry more than one person per horse, and the speed boost was giving the armies that could afford them a massive advantage. 
Not only did the Romans make chariot warfare a staple of their military, but they had enough that they could make chariot races one of their many high-stakes sports. But eventually, the appeal of a horse-drawn chariot started to wear thin, and armies started to wonder, what if I could improve this? You know, what would make a horse-drawn chariot even better if it had lots of sharp blades attached to it? So the scythe chariot entered the fray, and everyone nearby ran. Weaponized chariots were nothing new. Those riding in the chariots usually had swords and crossbows at the ready. What was different here was that the chariot itself was weaponized. Every wheel had horizontal blades around one meter long sticking out from the sides, as well as under the driver's seat. These would tear any enemy soldier who was unfortunate enough to encounter the chariot to shreds, and more importantly, it would cut the legs of enemy horses and bring them to the ground along with the enemy forces riding them. They were an effective way to cut through large infantry groups. A fast-moving scythe chariot could bring hundreds of men to the ground if it took them by surprise. So, why did it die out? The scythe chariot appeared to make its debut in the Persian military, reportedly in the mid-400s BC. It saw heavy use in the Persian Wars, cutting holes in the famous phalanx formations of the Greek and Macedonian armies. Armies would learn to avoid the scythe chariot, but that meant breaking formation and letting the Persians gain ground. However, they weren't much use on uneven ground or even against more loosely distributed troops, and they also stood the risk of injuring their own men or horses if they moved in the wrong direction. The scythe chariot saw more use in the era, but eventually faded from the battlefield, although it was briefly reinvented by Leonardo da Vinci who sketched it as one of his many, many inventions. And as warfare evolved, the need for new weapons increased. Number 4. The Corvus The First Punic War was one of the most critical wars of the Roman Empire's heyday, pitting them against the powerful Carthaginian army. They had powerful ships, and while the Roman army was no slouch, they were lacking in the naval warfare department. The biggest challenge was getting to the enemy and fighting them before they made landfall. Fortunately, the Romans had no shortage of engineers, and one device they created would have been lost to history if it wasn't for the writings of Polybius, a Greek historian responsible for much of the writings of the era. He made sure the Corvus survived its era, and even today many historians talk about this impressive and surprisingly controversial naval device, because in one move, it undid the Carthaginians' naval superiority. The Corvus was a bridge attached to a Roman ship with a small parapet on each side. The bridge was around 4 feet wide and 36 feet long, but what made it stand out was that it was attached to the boat by a system of pulleys. When the ship was on the move, it would be pulled up and out of the way. When an enemy ship approached, it would be lowered, and a spike at the base of the bridge would puncture the deck of the other ship. With the bridge fixed in place, suddenly dozens of Roman soldiers would board the ship and ambush them, ending the Carthaginian attack without a costly naval battle, and leaving the Roman ship intact and free to pull up the Corvus for their next attack. It was an ingenious invention. Or was it? While this could be challenging in rough seas, it was still easier than trying to place a boarding bridge manually. The only thing remaining of the Corvus are descriptions from Polybius's writings, so not too much is known about its actual construction. This has led to the spirited debates about how much it weighed, whether it was dangerous to use because it could unbalance both ships, and whether it was actually responsible for several major Roman naval disasters during the era. Modern architects have created their own designs for the Corvus, trying to recreate it and see just how Rome pulled off this impressive feat. Other architects, though, still insist the entire thing might have been an elaborate embellishment, might have never existed at all. But it's not out of the realm of possibility, considering they were up against some powerful enemies. Number 3. Hellenistic Warships The Carthaginian naval fleet put the Romans to the test, and they also taught them a thing or two. Once the Romans emerged victorious, they started developing their own powerful naval fleets. By the 4th century, these powerful wooden ships were among the largest ever to set sail, and must have looked more like massive cruise ships rather than standard warships. Without modern engines to power them, these warships used old-fashioned methods, oars, and lots of them. There were five levels, and each level had three very long oars sticking out of the side of the ship, with one oarsman breaking their back for each oar. These ships could carry large numbers of soldiers, but they were often hard to navigate and were subject to going off course easily. They looked impressive, but they weren't the most effective warships of the era. That honor went to the smaller warships that would come later. Often known as the Lembos, they required fewer oars and fewer soldiers to drive them and were more effective for stealth-based activities like espionage and piracy. While the massive earlier ships could be effective for storming a port, these smaller ships could sneak up behind their biggest counterparts, send agents on board, and sabotage the ship from within. And that might be the only way to get through some of those massive warships which were designed for ramming other ships. Backed by rows of rowers pushing themselves to the limit, they could simply crash into an inferior navy, crush the ships beneath their hulls, and train all their fire on the heart of the enemy fleet. But perhaps the most impressive innovations of ancient warfare were on the ground. Number 2. Siege Towers 
In ancient times, city-states had figured the best way to prevent attacks, simply don't let anyone in. It was common for cities to have massive walls around them, and the only way in being through a drawn gate. Sure, the city of Troy tried that and fell the subterfuge, but giant wooden gift horse plans only work once, so usually the only way in was through combat. But the people behind the walled city usually had a major advantage over those out in the open, shooting at them from the outside. The main strategy was usually climbing the walls, but those who tried often got hot oil poured on them. So around the 11th century BCE, the Babylonians and Assyrians came up with a new strategy, build a fortress of your own. Enter the Siege Tower. Sometimes as high as 40 meters, siege towers were massive wooden formations built on site at battles outside walled cities. They would be built as high as the walls of the fortress, with several levels each manned by soldiers. Sometimes the tower would even have catapults or trebuchets built into it, and the concealed nature of the tower made it difficult for the city's defenders to know where to aim to take it down. The only option was overwhelming force, and then it became a one-on-one -on -one battle between the fortress and the tower. If the tower was brought close enough to the wall, moved by hundreds of soldiers, the team on top could then easily leap over the wall into the city and take the fight inside the fortress. But these massive weapons had their drawbacks. For one thing, they were massive. Not only did it take especially designed systems to move them as well as a lot of manpower, but one wrong move on the ground could crush people underneath. Then there was the fact that they were mostly made of wood, and one flaming arrow could undo them in a way that the walled cities weren't vulnerable to. They also took a long time to construct, during which the army might be vulnerable to attack, and building them off-site and then transporting them usually wasn't feasible. Not only were they extremely heavy, but they could easily get stuck in muddy ground. Despite these drawbacks, they were incredibly powerful and kept on being used by attackers well into the Middle Ages. But to find the most insane ancient weapons of all, we have to go back to one of the most iconic ancient empires. Number 1. The Mad Weapons of Archimedes Across ancient Greece, there were few names more renowned than Archimedes. A mathematician, physicist, engineer, and inventor, he was the da Vinci of his era, responsible for inventing many of the core concepts of advanced math, much to the dismay of many school children. He came up with countless bold concepts. Some of his inventions, like astronomical instruments, are still used today. Others were just crazy experiments that never really panned out. But amid his many inventions were two of the craziest weapons ever designed. But did they actually work? The first was the Claw of Archimedes. Looks like something out of science fiction. It was designed to defend the city wall of Syracuse against warships. While only descriptions remain, most historians believe it was a crane equipped with a grappling hook that would attach to the front of the ship. It would then be raised, raising the ship with it, and sending the crew and their weapons toppling into the ocean below. The Claw of Archimedes may have been key during the Second Punic War, when Rome sent powerful naval fleets against Syracuse only to be routed, courtesy of the weapon known as the Iron Hand. But was another invention even more deadly? The Mirror of Archimedes was not a vanity device the famous scientist used in his private quarters. Rather, his sketches and notes indicated that it was a massive glass that would be mounted to a ship. By absorbing the sun's rays, it would then focus them and reflect them back in the direction the mirror was pointed, right at the enemy ship. The wooden ship would then catch on fire and sink to the bottom of the sea, in a massive scale version of frying ants with a magnifying glass. But did either of these inventions actually work? With so little evidence of Archimedes' inventions left, it's come down to skeptical scientists and engineers to test them by recreating them to scale. MIT professor David Wallace assembled a team of students to test the mirror of Archimedes. They tried on both cloudy and sunny days, and the mirror was never able to light a model ship on fire, leading most to believe this was a colorful myth. On the other hand, the team behind the series Super Weapons of the Ancient World on the Discovery Channel built a model off of what they knew about the Claw of Archimedes and succeeded in toppling a model of a Roman ship. So at least one of Archimedes' mad inventions might have ruled the seas. Strange weapons didn't stop with ancient times. Check out weirdest World War II weapons you've never heard of to learn more, or watch this video instead.